What's not to love about American Giant? American made, jobs for Americans, and they're manufacturing top-notch clothing with that good old American craftsmanship. They're also doing great things with the Rescue 22 Foundation. American Giant came up with this limited edition Rescue 22 classic full zip hoodie to help fund a service dog for a veteran in need. You can snag one on their website, American-Giant.com. American Giant believes that work and building up American manufacturing communities brings purpose, and purpose results in a better product. If you need quality clothing like jeans, t-shirts, and sweatshirts, check them out at American-Giant.com slash Jack and get 20% off with discount code Jack at checkout. This is the Danger Close Podcast, Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is my friend, Trevor Thompson. Trevor is a former Navy SEAL, served at SDV Team 1 out in Hawaii. Those are the mini submarines. He jumps off bridges, cliffs, buildings, does wingsuit flying, and is working on his Master Alaska Hunting Guide accreditation, and just an amazing guy right now. He is working for Protect, that is P-R-O-T-E-K-T right here. I've been using their supplements since they started in 2021, uh, in particular their hydration and their energy right here, fueling me through these last few novels. So he also has just gotten into making traditional bows. And we just shot uh, those outside and he brought this up. This is mahogany obsidian, an arrowhead that, uh, that he made for me and brought up, which was extremely thoughtful. This thing is absolutely beautiful. So now, without further ado, Trevor Thompson. Trevor, what's up, man? <laughs> How are you doing? Thanks for being here. This yeah. is awesome. I can't believe you hadn't been up to the house yet. Well, I've just been to the other house. I know. I feel, I mean, it's, it feels like one day has passed since we were there and then everything's turned into one long day recently. Yeah. I mean, you're supposed to sleep. You know that, right? Uh, I've been told. That's how you reset. Speaking of sleep, uh, I need to do the rest. I'll give it another shot. Give the rest. But I've been using the energy and the hydration from Protect and um, just going through those uh, hydration ones just like every day. Yeah. And the hydration ones are fantastic to do that with and you can take two to five of them a day yeah. no problem. And the rest for me has been a game changer. I think I was saying that inside. I take it every night and the rest. Oh yeah. Cause it, it helps you get a better night's sleep that you're going to get. So uh -huh. if, you, if you only have five hours, you're going to get the best five hours possible. Okay. If you have eight, you're going to get the best eight possible. Okay. Um, in your case, if you have zero, you, you <laughs> might just stumble around a little more tired. Well, <laughs> that's, no, that's no change. It's just, that's... it's GABA, L-theanine and valerian root. So it just lowers anxiety. It doesn't yeah. kind of down regulate your brain. It doesn't okay. uh, make you go to sleep. It's not like a sleep aid. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. What do you put it in? Water. Just what? How much? Uh, about eight ounces. Okay. Yeah. So just boom. I mean, I don't how, wake up, you know, at 2 a.m. and be like, oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, um, uh, how much time do you uh, leave before you actually go to bed? Like, I try and leave about a half an hour so uh, half after hour I take bed. some of that. Yeah. Okay. I'll give it. A, I'll give it another shot. Maybe give I wasn't. Maybe I wasn't doing it quite right. It it works. I mean, it's stuff like um, I think Tim Ferriss tried some, and he's like, "This shit works for real." Nice. That's what turned him on to a lot of our stuff. Oh man, well, I'm loving the energy, loving the hydration. I've been, gosh, I've been on using that stuff for is it a year? Maybe a year and a half. Once again, once again, everything's turned into one long day. Um, but uh, when did the company start? Uh, three and a half years ago. Okay. Yeah. So then it must be year and a half, even two years. Oh yeah. Then I've been, uh, when I got my first, first box of that stuff from, yeah. from Nick and, and started giving it a go. Um, but yeah, it's all, and it's, it's good. And then what was really cool, I forget who I talked to about it. my first box arrived and, and, uh, gosh, who did I talk to? Somebody was like, oh man, that's a great team they put together over there. One, you can trust those guys. They're all in on, um, everything being, you know, natural and, and good for you and the rest of it. And I was like, okay, check Roger that. Okay. Yeah. You know, everybody's pretty um like athletic conscious and bodily conscious you know there's a there's a, a bunch of athletes on the team like yeah. we were talking about earlier mark healy's on the team so awesome uh, founder and everybody really wants the best for their system yeah. and uh, they were trying to fill a gap in the market 
yeah. really good, natural, as close to organic product as we could get. So great. Yeah. Man, awesome. Awesome. Making me thirsty right now. Well, what am I holding here? Look at this. People are like, why is he holding this arrow? This thing is amazing. I pissed him off and he threatened Incredible. me. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is amazing. So um, and when did you come up with the, uh, you got that bear uh, recurve like four years ago? Oh, no, that must have been five 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 ish five years ago so yeah. it came up to the, the house and we were checking mm -hmm. that thing out and i forget did you get the anniversary edition no i didn't i just got that's a standard i need uh, to get the anniversary the edition Kodiak. but i've missed it oh, so now i've got to find it i uh it's got, got too busy it was they're on my list there. they're out there okay i need to i need to track one of those down but uh so you brought that that up and mm -hmm. we uh, we launched a few arrows at the house with that we did. and uh i knew you'd start making bows yeah i sort of lost my mind there um last year January, I want to say, uh, January, February, Logan Stark and I uh -huh. went out to Corey Hawk's place and made bows. And I thought it was fantastic. I'm like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. We made hunting weight bows, like 65 ish pound draw okay. weight. Um, and it took about a year to really boil under my skin that I really want to make one. <laughs> yeah. And I just said, screw it. And I built a shave horse bench in the garage and ordered a bow stave and said i'll just watch some videos and remember what i learned from Corey and give it a rip um so i talked to a couple people online including Corey and uh, clay hayes and they recommended a few things and i built the osage bow that's on the ground and then that was two weeks ago and then this week i built the u bow that's on the ground man let's check them out let me see these yeah. things let me see these things this and what's uh, what is Corey's background so um, Corey was a Marine, and he's been building bows for quite a long time. I'd have to look to see yeah. exactly how long. Um, so this is thing. Osage Orange. Oh, oh, oh. And, look at this thing. Uh, that's a linen backing instead of an actual diamond back. I didn't want to blow up a diamond back skin for my, my first bow that I built yeah. in the garage. Yeah. It looks like the, pre the Predator. I'd call yeah. this thing Predator. Man, this is awesome. We're gonna shoot these things afterward. We're going to. Um, but uh, and so, how long did you make this? So, um, about a week and a half ago, and Dang. it took about three days uh, for me to do. And that's a traditional North American bow wood Osage orange. Is uh, it's got great characteristics to it. Okay, and I, I wrapped it with some buckskin. Yeah, right here. Handle. Mm -hmm. And so oh. then uh, I took what I learned from that, and that's shooting great right now. Yeah. And built this U Pacific U bow. I see that one. Yeah. I see that one. I'll trade you. Nice. Nice. And so I. Ooh, that's beautiful. I gave a, a couple different things on this yeah. one. I, that was the first time I bent wood, so I boiled the tips and then recurved them back, and that gives wow. it a little bit faster cast, like arrow throw. No way. Um, a little less string follow. Yeah, it just makes it a smoother bow, um, which is, which is why many bows have recurves on the tips. Man. Grow, so growing fun. up, I always had, I always wanted to make my own bow, mm -hmm. hunt with it, and you know go through the whole process with something that I made uh, from the ground up. Have not done it yet, um, but uh, yeah, you, this you is pretty sick. It. This is pretty cool, man. Well, and what Amazing. really you know, wow, I think what, I think the catalyst for the end of me needing to do this was uh, rereading Last of the Breed. Nice, I've, I've more read Last it like the breed. Yep. four or five times, but I, yep. I'm re I'm, That's I just finished <laughs> rereading it. I'm like. All right, I'm doing this. Yeah, I don't care. I'm making nice. this happen. That was when I was reading it when it first came out. I know exactly where I was. I can picture myself exactly where I was, and uh, reading that book and having that same uh, a dream oh, of being man. able to do that. Joe Mack. Yeah, yeah. And then what you're holding is a 650 grain Sitka spruce um, shaft, dude. And that's wild turkey fletchings on the back. Wow. Um, and yeah, it, that's about as close to, Dang. you know. Beautiful. Paleolithic or primitive. Yeah. Uh, they try not to say primitive because it's really not primitive. Like, that's a little derogatory as a term, mm. but it, it's a good way to describe it to people. Yeah. It's just a wood arrow. Wow. That's beautiful. And what is this? Uh, is there tar somewhere on this? Or no, there so with... that's artificial sinew. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. I have one right here. So I think there's some tar on one of the arrows that's up there. So these have yeah. one on the wall right there. Oh yeah. So that's a deer bone yeah. at the end of it. And there's tar that's holding it on freaking cool. right there. And uh, yeah, tracker Joe zero eight on Instagram uh, made that for me after he read Savage Sun, which was uh, in part inspired by last of the breed. And it looks like a Cherokee style arrow. Okay. It's uh, to me. 
it's pretty, it's, yeah, Super we'll go cool. check it out yeah. afterward. It's beautiful, which is why it's right there yeah. on the wall. Under Not that, moving. Under that Parker, yeah, that's legit. But then you also maybe some arrows right here to these guys. Oh, to, yeah. Uh, to actually shoot. To actually shoot. <laughs> yeah, through this bow right there. <laughs> that so looks gorgeous. That. Yeah. So yeah, he built that. And oh yeah. Well, well this, this will be my first time shooting it. We'll shoot it today. I've been telling yeah, him I'm, uh, I've been so roll. busy. I haven't had a chance to to do it. He'll get some but, good uh, pictures. I don't know why I haven't had a chance to do it because there are 22 targets like within um, almost a football's throw of us right now. Yeah, leave it to um, the hunting guide to look at one and go, hey, look up. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> this is awesome, man. This is really sweet. So I'm so fired up that you're you're doing that. Yeah, man, just incredible. Wow. But before that, let's. Uh, I mean, you've always been, uh, like, uh, is artsy the right word? Yeah, that's a great word for it. Yeah, because what did you do before the SEAL teams? You were going to, to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so before I joined the Navy, I was at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Yeah, uh, wow. Which is the... That's pretty serious. Yeah, it's the museum-based school in Chicago. It's the large art museum there. And it's been around since the 1800s. Um, a goofy fact about them is they have the largest um, impressionist collection period I, I think even more than france france has yeah. been trying to get some of that stuff back so i was going to school there that the was art crazy. world's crazy don't mean to interrupt you it's art weird. world world is insane there are all those stories about uh uh getty in uh, in la oh, yeah. and how they like you, people can go back and i think there's some um uh i'm sure there are multiple articles uh about how some of those paintings arrived and how some of that artwork got in there it's and interesting then isn't it it's a real like a whole underworld type thing like it's very interesting i'm gonna have to explore it in the pages of a future novel perhaps just to have the excuse of putting in the time into uh to studying that yeah, world get some time to go behind closed doors at the art institute or at the getty yeah it's a cool place yeah interesting there's some there's, there's some shady things going on sometimes sometimes man so how did you get there what was so, the uh, um yeah. my dad does bronzes and has been a painter his whole life he didn't really pursue it, but encouraged me to do it. Uh, my mom was an artist, also encouraged me to get deep into that art. Yeah. Um, and so that's where I ended up going instead of going to music school because I was also playing trumpet in orchestras and jazz bands. And in so way. instead of doing one, I did the other. Okay. Uh, I applied to Chicago, and Chicago's got a great program. No way. I wanted to do museum restoration. So really? I wanted to be able to handle the Renoirs, the Durs, the... Yeah, all of the art that you can't really no see way. up that close. Yeah. When you're that young, what are they looking at? Like, what does your resume up to that point have on it? Where they're like, "Hey, this is a, this is a good candidate." It's art. You know, you come in with a book, and it's bring your pieces, show us why, and then you get interviewed. It's a lot of personal interviews. Really. Um. Yeah. So, how many people are like? In, you have a class that you start with? Or yeah. What? It was a couple hundred people, I think. Okay. Um. All over the world. From. No, it was mostly all over the country. There's mm -hmm. some international students. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but mostly U.S. Mostly United States, yeah. Okay, but it was it was super cool because like that school is part of the museum, and the museum was started for the school. Wow! So you have access to all this, so we're able to go do drawings while sitting in front of a, a Holbein or sitting in front of a Monet. Wow! It it's there for the students. You know, wow! It's, yeah, it's it's in, it's incredible. Where did the restoration part come from? What made you want to well, do the restoration rather than a little bit of rationality? Uh, I I wanted a job and okay. you can actually get a job doing that. Okay. As opposed to being a gallery artist where you're kind of at the, the whim and the fancy of whoever's buying your stuff. Okay. Um, as well as I wanted to touch the stuff. Like, wow. You know, I'm, I've always been the person that goes into a museum and I'm like, well, I want to, I want to grab the sword. I want to know what that thing yeah. feels like. It like, belongs in the yeah. museum. Like, yeah. Like, I want that. No way. Um, and so I was there, that was 2006. Uh, the war had been kind of going pretty hot. I was 18, mm. didn't feel like I was contributing. Uh, yeah. And that comes from a really long family history of service. My family's served in every conflict back past the revolution. Oh, wow. Yeah. And both my granddads are alive and one was in Korea, the other one was in World War II. And so wow. I, I have that direct connection mm -hmm. to service for the country. And I just decided like, I, I, I can't, I can't sit here in school yeah. and not do something when this is going on right now. Did they tell you stories growing up? Oh, yeah. Both. And my dad's dad just turned 100 in, yeah, this February. Wow. Yep. Amazing. Happy birthday, dad's dad. Yeah. 
So Very he cool. uh, he did seven combat landings in the South Pacific. Oh my gosh! And now he's a hundred, <laughs> and he's he, doing just fine. He's a marine. He's a marine. Wow. Yeah, he's a lineman. Gosh. So he ran lines for the telephones, like the wind up phones, back and forth in combat, repairing them, getting them set because there's no other way. You know, we they didn't have walkie talkies. Not rocking that in bitter. Nope. There's no in bitter. There's no wow. uh, PRC five. Like you got to run that shit back and forth. So that was his job. Wow. Mm-hmm. That is wild. Yeah. Yeah. Did uh, and what and before that, did he hear stories from he did from his father from World so War One? From or? his father and from his, I believe it's his grandfather um, or great grandfather was in the Civil War. So dang, direct line of communication. So he had heard to, stories from the Civil War. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. That's incredible. And we had family members fight on both sides. Um, so we've really run the gamut of the American experience there. Yeah, interesting. I did not yeah. know that. Um, I can't believe we never talked about that before. Um, yeah. we talked to Clint Trial about it, and oddly enough, his family's got the same history. Oh, interesting. Yeah, all the way back past the uh, revolution. Oh, man. Like, wow, what are Clint's the chances gonna, both of us? That's wild. Yeah, Clint's going to come up here at some point, too. They're that tight. Yeah, that's what yeah. I love about the podcast is an excuse because there's so much going on. It's an excuse to put the phone down, turn it off yeah. and just hang out for a little bit. So, Precisely. um, yeah, Clint's going to come up here at some point and, uh, Love that guy. and, uh, yeah, he's amazing. Oh my gosh. Incredible. Well, I didn't know that about either of you. And, uh, in this last book in only the dead, I gave, I did a little more of a deep dive into James Reese's background and put uh, a family member on either side yeah. of the, uh, the conflict of the civil war, uh, as well for him. I had his wife's family making, uh, modifying yeah. rifles that were coming over from, from England. Um, and, uh, so anyway, that was really cool, but I didn't know that about that's that's yeah, incredible i mean it, it, it was cool growing up with that kind of history um did you hear like french and indian war is that what yeah. wow like all the way back through and i mean we have a um a letter written from my dad's my dad's mom's side of the family mm. and one of my family members was interred at andersonville oh and he was a flag bearer and he had we have the tassel from the bottom of the flag wow and a letter describing where it came from and a picture of him all framed so i, I mean i grew up with that kind of stuff in the house and it's it's wild to know that we were participating in all these things. Yeah, man. So we just took our little guy. Um, I, should, I, should, I should stop calling him that. He's twelve, about to be thirteen. He's a little compared um, to us, you know. Yeah, yeah. He's always going to be my my little guy, probably. But um, the, we went out to Gettysburg with him this wow. summer and uh, did the full tour of Gettysburg. And it's uh, you know I've, I've read, of course, Killer Angels, mm-hmm. and everybody who has book. not read Killer Angels should read Killer Angels oh, yeah. for sure. Um, but uh, but I learned so much more. When I was out there, and I meant to reread it before, but there's so much going on, I didn't get a chance. To, it's a, that's to, a dense book too. It's, uh, but it, but it makes it. I love it that it's that it, that it humanizes it, so it's not yeah. like a history book, you know. No, no. And uh, that's what I love about his book, and then his son's work as well. Um, but we, and and he lived. The, the son lives out there. Oh no, kidding. Yeah, yeah. It's it's wild. Saw his house, and um, and uh, it's just. I learned so much more being there on the ground, though. Than uh, and I I think I was there in like third grade, so when I was eight maybe. Um, but doing it now and then with the experiences that we've had overseas and, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing, a little more mileage, um, uh, it was really cool to, to walk those fields and, and, uh, look at the terrain and, and kind of know where, visually, not just reading and kind of imagining, you know, or maybe seeing yeah. a map and seeing like some arrows or something, but to be there and then to be looking out. Oh, I see just this, uh, this, this little roll of this hill. I see how you wouldn't, you know, see this group coming this way and here's flanking here and these guys left and cause of communication issues. And yep. it's, uh, it's really interesting. Everybody should go to it's Gettysburg. It's, they do a good job. With that it. kind of stuff is so interesting and it's, it should touch your soul. Yeah, it does. Like I, I felt that way when I went and visited um, the Little Bighorn. Oh, wow. You know, because I've read, like, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee yep. and all the bits and pieces yep. from the uh, Custer school. side. And, like, I've read through um, Red Cloud's writing. And mm-hmm. then you get to go and experience it. And you're like, oh, man, this is mm-hmm. where this happened. and uh, Like, that experience. And then I traveled to um, Andersonville, and I got to visit. Wow. Knowing that I had a family member that was kept prisoner there. That's crazy. was wild. It was yeah. a very, like, it's hard to describe. It was, it was a strange emotion for me. Yeah. Like, wow, this. If people don't know Andersonville, they should look it up and uh, do a little research on what happened there. Yeah. Oh, brutal. It's incredible. Yeah. Man, I'm going to go to Little Bighorn, too. I've been meaning to 
get there and go there with someone that, that can walk ish. you through yeah, and uh and uh really instead of me just like reading something and going there looking and you know huh, back in the car kids yeah uh, that uh, going there with someone who's really studied the, obviously the battle and the terrain and everything else and can pass along some of those lessons and it's a special you know, place that they have set aside amazing man that is wild. Um, and how, so how far does that, uh, does that family history go back? French and Indian war. And then, do you know where people came from? Yeah, we do. So, here? um, I think our first, I believe I'm getting this date right. Uh, first family member came in 1649 mm. and was a stowaway. So we had an illegal immigrant, um, come over and then we can trace the history further back, um, to like ancillary parts of the Danish royal oh, wow. sort of family um, about the year I think nine hundred or thousand. Okay, yeah, yeah. We might be rela- We might be brothers, actual brothers. Possible. Yeah, man, that's kind of that's where part of the, of our family comes from. That's as well. rad, um, man. That's that's amazing that you have that uh, that lineage. That is really cool. So you're thank my grandmother. She did all the work. Okay, yeah, she dove into it. Yeah, my mom's doing that right now. Uh, she comes out here once a year to to Utah because whether you're Mormon or not, apparently the Mormons have a lot of uh, of um, they have all the histories. Yeah, of everybody, all the people. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not just Mormons. No, yeah, it's wild. I didn't really know that until uh, yeah. until we moved out here. Uh, so she's been putting that stuff to together and trying it's to good to have. Yeah, and trying to figure out what what family kind of stories were rumors, what yeah. were true, what, how do we uh, anyway? So it's. Uh, that, that's pretty cool. So we're getting that together. So hopefully that, uh, that our kids will then now have Fantastic. something, you know, tangible that they can point to yeah. rather than, oh, I think I heard this from my mom who heard it from so-and-so. And so that's uh, that'd be really cool to, to get that together. Yeah. We, we had that all put together. And then about the same time, my dad sat down with his dad and had him talk through his entire time oh, in, wow. in the Pacific. Um, well from training all the way then to the Pacific. So we have that all written down Dude. while he was, very very lucid and, huh. and wanted to talk about it yeah so he would have been probably in his 70s i'd say 80s maybe wow yeah man that's amazing it's been cool for our uh, daughter to go with best defense foundation and yeah. go out to normandy and be assigned to a veteran as a caretaker and then go to pearl harbor also and do that same thing there and sit down with these guys and hear their stories and have this touch point with these people that are between let's say 96 and 103 yeah um and uh and very, share meals and, disappearing and yeah it's uh it's so for her to have that touch point and to have those stories from those people rather than just reading it eventually or reading about these battles or this time in history, but it's really, I think changed her life. Um, having that experience, she calls him. I talked to one of my guy yesterday. That's awesome. Um, yeah. It's Walter up in, uh, in Seattle. Talked to him and, uh, uh, my daughter calls the, well, the guy, Jack, that she was in charge of, or that was helped uh, on this trip, uh, who's in Texas and man. So Jack is, um, Jack Stowe. He is a hunt, almost a hundred. And he's still like on his repairing his roof and like doing all these things that he shouldn't be doing. It's freaking awesome. Amazing. Such an, so inspirational. Just keep living life. Yeah. It's yeah. incredible. Absolutely incredible. But uh, that's great that you guys got those those stories and you had those touch points. So you're in, at uh, art school, for mm-hmm. lack of a, a, a better term. That's what it is. Term. And uh, how long are you there before you decide that it's time to Maybe enlist? Maybe two months. Okay. Uh, yeah. It was pretty quick for me. I very quickly realized that that was not the path I wanted to be on. Okay. Is that because you felt like you needed to be elsewhere or Did let's I, say there wasn't a war going on and, uh, I probably would have stayed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the war. Is so pretty, you did like it. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I still paint and draw and do digital mm-hmm. art and I mean, this is, you know, creative mm-hmm. and yeah. it's just, it's in my blood and I'm, I'm never going to be able to make that go away. Yeah. It's a thing that being able to express what you can't express with language sometimes yeah. with your hands via some medium is the way to go. Yeah. Um, and that's just in me. How so, many people were there to, uh, like, on, is there an art restoration path or were, were people there for all sorts of it's different everything. paths? Everything. Um, everything from some strange installation stuff that you mm-hmm. might not understand and that I definitely might not agree with. Uh, installation, like installation of like art. Like you walk into a building and there's a couch hanging from the ceiling upside down. Oh, okay. Yeah, that could be somebody's art for Check. some reason. Um, but the, the other side of that was the printmaking restoration side of the the house. Um, and that you get to do some stuff there that isn't really common, um, like stone lithography. So you're drawing on a stone in, in reverse with a crayon, 
and then you etch away or you, you cover it with a, a medium and then you pull off the crayon and you etch it away. And that's how they used to do like newspaper printings for like drawings and, no and stuff. Yeah. Um, and that, that medium is going to go away eventually because the, uh, the quarry that they quarried all that slate out of doesn't exist anymore. And yeah. they've dumped most of those rocks into the ocean yeah. that they used for stone litho. And every time you do another one, you grind off the top layer. So that image is gone forever. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Man. So in art restoration, do uh, most people work for a museum or are there private collections that also need things? There are likely private collections that need the same sort of care. Yeah. Um, but then you, the museum has them on staff yeah. um, because you can't have that stuff sitting out all the time. You know, somebody needs to go in and clean it because the you know, tens of thousands of people that are walking through and just breathing and uh, um, shedding dirt and dust, it all gets on the art regardless of how huh. they try and protect it. Huh. Um, so somebody has to go in there and clean it. Somebody has to get it back to looking good. Yeah. Um, and in some cases somebody has to make sure that it doesn't get destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Like most of what I know of art restoration comes from the Daniel Silva novels, the Gabriel <laughs> Alon series, yeah. Israeli assassin, yeah. who, uh, <laughs> whose latest book, The Collector, is out now. For those who have not read Daniel Silva, they're fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, that series has been going for for a long time now. But uh, incredible books, absolutely incredible books. But uh, so you're there for two months, yeah, and then just about. And then I went down and talked to a recruiter without telling my parents. I was like, well, in Chicago. Yep. I'm like, sorry, mom and dad. I'm 18. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. Um, he had given me all of Larry Chambers, um, alert books oh. and growing up. So I'd read those. I mean, I'd read platoon. I'd read, you know, the, so you're aware of special candidate. operations in Vietnam. Yeah. I was aware of special operations in Vietnam. I didn't have a, a path that I wanted. I didn't So you weren't like seals, seals. Oh, absolutely not. Oh. And I've said this before to people that, like, unlike you or Andy, mm-hmm. um, that kind of knew from a very young age, that's what I want to do. That's the thing. That's my direction. I mean, I was going to art school. Yeah. Like, let's be serious here. I wasn't on the path to being a Navy SEAL or a snake eater, green beret. You yeah. Know? Like that wasn't a thing. So I thought about it and I was like, what's the hardest, quickest way that I can get overseas? Huh. The combination of the both. Right. And that I went with the SEAL teams. How did you do that research then? Uh, I probably just, literally sat there and went on a search engine. I mean, this was 2006. So yeah, Google, but that might've been the only search engine I was able so to you just Googled it and was like, Oh, seals. Yeah. I, and I think I thought like, ah, what's the closest thing to the LERP teams? Okay. Cause they didn't really have them around anymore. Mm. Not, not to my knowledge. I was so outside of that circle of understanding in the military. Yeah that I just picked the thing that was closest to me. Really? So you didn't, you didn't do a full on deep dive into SEALs versus Rangers versus Army Special Forces versus not, PJs? Not particularly. Or, like yeah. I, PJs didn't even occur to me. Yeah. Um, I think the things that occurred to me were like Ranger Bat, mm. SF, and the SEAL teams. Gotcha. And SF seemed like too long of a track. I was like, man, this war's been going for five years. Yeah, so yeah. I better get in right. this You're going to miss it. Yeah. And um, my minimal research yeah. felt like Ranger Bat at to me from the outside looking in um, wasn't going to be as special forces. See, that makes sense. I don't know. It felt like my research said, ah, they're a blocking force. They do a lot of fighting. Like the fighting wasn't necessarily the big thing that I was interested in. It was the, the whole holistic Mm -hmm. approach to the entirety of the unit that I was going to join. So that's what I picked seal teams, man. How long did it take before before you walked into that recruiter and then you got on that bus to to great lakes or or you just walk over to great lakes one year. Okay. No, I went home. So I took a leave of absence with the school and I finished the year out because I told my parents I would, Uh, Hey, I'll finish the year. I'll just train while I'm here. And I went home, got a job as a lifeguard and did nothing but train. I just followed. And that was 2007. So that was all of Stu Smith beach lifeguard or like a pool somewhere. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I grew up surfing a little bit and swimming and, um, from LA. So I'm close enough to the ocean that that stuff didn't Mm -hmm. weird me out or feel odd. Mm -hmm. Um, but I lifeguarded that summer there and they let me train. It was like at a high school. Mm -hmm. Um, so I trained on the track and did whatever, but I just followed Stu's books and. Okay. Yeah. So you're doing like the Navy SEAL prep program. Uh, yeah. Stu Smith. Yeah. Yeah. The like little you know, 110 page book or whatever it is. That's Stu Smith, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think his books have probably got more guys through buds than any other program. Okay. Was he like the first? 
book I, that you could get that kind of yeah, I don't think there was, I don't think there was anything else out um, at the time. Nothing. I remember really. I had some in the eighties. I had some. Might have been Betamax VHS tapes from the back of Soldier of Fortune magazine. That was I've like, seen these. but it was just a dude working out, <laughs> yeah. like, and he was like, just we'll do squats ca- now. Yeah, it was just like it was the one, two, three. Yep. Won't do. I think I've seen some uh, of those. And I, and, you know, and and when I did get to to buds, like, there, there was still the same type of stuff. I mean, they were still doing that in 07. <laughs> yeah, yeah, still same type of type of deal. But uh, yeah, flutter kicks and flutter good morning kicks. darlings yeah. and push ups and eight count bodybuilders, which are eerily similar to burpees. Um, Someday and, you may yeah. have to do 45 minutes of flutter kicks. <laughs> it was good, that, fantastic. But that's what this guy was. I think he was, uh, I think he's a development group guy, maybe back in the day or something mm. like that. And he was a big dude. I forget his name right now. It's slipping my mind, but I will remember it because uh, there wasn't very much out there. Yeah. back then you know and so and anything even, i saw i would just i get and even when i got in i think latrell's book came out right before i joined the like right before i signed my contract okay because uh, that was 2007 okay and that, and that had only happened what two years prior yeah. yeah wow so you get there so you go uh boot camp do they have the pre-buds thing there? we were like the second class to do it so okay it was a bit Sorry, guys, whoever, if you're listening and you were part of this program, sorry, it was a circus. Oh, yeah. Like it, oh, hilarious. it was a bit of a circus. I've, a very expensive circus from a what I remember. A very expensive circus. Yeah. And that, I've heard now that they've actually done a good job. And yeah. It's, it's professionalized pretty well, it. It's professionalized. It was pretty well run. But at the time, yeah. man, we went through that and it was a circus. Wow. And then we went to PTRR and INDOC. We did, oh, so you did it all. We did it all. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, ah, we don't know. I think I was only there for six weeks like or five weeks. And then we went through PTR and INDOC. And now it's like a two or three month program. Okay. So you did boot camp, and were you in a, um, what do they call it? Yeah, a division? One of the dive mo divisions. Okay. So yeah. you were in a division with people that were going either to try to be SEALs or EOD or rescue, rescue swimmers. swimmer, diver. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, so you stayed there and learned how to, what, carry logs and boats? No, and, they, no, they didn't, didn't have that. that. It was like workout y stuff. Oh, okay. They just had us do like track and field workouts and swim. They had a pool there. Yeah. Yeah. Pool. Yeah. So we just did extra we did exactly what i was doing at home gotcha. like oh this is like totally normal okay but i've since heard that they do that's one of the things else. they kind of yeah. teach you some techniques of certain things i guess which we did whatever. that at ptr and indoc yeah yeah but that was because our class was only maybe a third okay guys coming from that program everybody else were fleet returnees yeah um which they've since basically phased out okay but Man. i don't know i kind of liked having um ncos that were from the fleet yeah it, I think that really smoothed out like how to be in the Navy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Barely. We had a couple guys like that, but I don't really, you know, remember them. They were old. Those guys. Exactly. They're, oh my uh, God. He's like 30. A, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were, they were uh, that would have been really old. I think they were probably like 25. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 26. I'm sure those guys were like 25 or 26. Super old. Sure. They've been in the fleet for two years. I was 19. Ancient. <laughs> um, and so, so you go from there to uh, buds, do PTRR, which is yeah. the pre thing, just kind of waiting for your class to, to actually commence with first phase and mm-hmm. now you're doing PT in the sand yep. and uh, carrying some boats, maybe carrying yelled some that a little bit logs. Getting, yeah. Yell that not as much as you're going to be yelled at in a yeah. few weeks. Um, you're learning how to do the, the O course, mm-hmm. running some technique. Of course. I think the Zodiac boats, like it's just the, the little technique stuff yeah. that would probably hamper somebody from yeah. making a legitimate effort at getting through the program. Right. Yeah. Right. And then in the first phase you go. Damn right. And how was hell week for you? Um, it wasn't too bad for me, Like I lost, I think nine or 10 pounds. Uh, but when I came out of it, I was a little sick and I had like walking pneumonia. Um, and at the time they would do drown proofing one attempt before hell week. And I think they had the assumption that if you couldn't make it through that you were panicky and you would probably quit. Huh. So there was a, a group of us that didn't pass the drown proofing. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, which includes the not, lifeguard. Not, not tie- well, it's like not tying and the, oh, the underwater swim. And okay. like, I think I failed for um, procedure on not tying. Yeah. It, all the rest of the stuff was fine. Like all the floating and bobbing and the underwater swim. It was the, yeah. I think I procedurally failed. And the instructor was like, don't worry, you'll have another attempt. Like you know. when you have walking pneumonia the exactly. day after hell week. Yeah. So that was when I got my other attempt and I failed okay. flat out. Oh, yeah. And the staff were like, what the hell? Didn't you do this and this? Like, weren't you alive? I'm like, yeah. And like I'm sick, yeah. yeah. So I went through the whole DRB board. Oh dang. Oh yeah. Well, because if you fail, you fail, right? They're gonna roll you back or get rid of you. I was terrified. I was in my blues and like, this is how it goes. Wow. I'm gonna get through hell week and they're gonna get rid of me for not tying. Mm-hmm. And I don't uh, know if I ever have heard a story from somebody. Well, like this. so not tying was the first one. All the rest of them were fine. And then 
now having pneumonia, I couldn't even do the swim or like nothing else was functioning. So I failed for the entirety of the thing. Oh, geez. You know, I think that was different than how we did it. Yeah. Um, so I go in front of the board and, you know, they see like a super nervous, I'm about to get kicked out, 19 Uh, year old standing in front of them. And uh, I think it was Kevin Stark. Instructor Stark, yeah, yeah. Um, who looked at me and he's like, "Calm the fuck." Name. He's like, "Calm the fuck down. You're what we want here. Get get healthy and don't fuck this up again." Nice, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And then it was at the time Chief Good or Senior Chief Good uh-huh. um, pulled me aside and he's like, "Don't fuck this up." Like, yeah. he just looked at me. Oh, oh I mean, he's cool. looking down at me because he's, yeah, yeah. he's a freaking giant, right? Um, and then I passed fine. Nice. It was not a big deal. But oh man, that's, I still have my um, little rope. Oh yeah, not tying little, up. Yeah, little like section. I think there's some uh, like maybe rigger's tape on yeah, the I ends of it, something tape. like that. Uh, but Are it's you, in it's somewhere around here. Yeah. It's I think it's in this room. It used to be in that box with my yeah. knife. I still have my there. first phase helmet. Nice and my UDT shorts. Ah, uh, nice. Yeah. yeah, I think we saved a couple UDT shorts, <laughs> a couple white T-shirts, a couple yeah. brown T-shirts. Uh, my knife from Buds is right over there. Oh, I, I have a brown the whole t- time. I have a brown T-shirt too. Nice. Those were got really soft. Oh, and they like before when before people knew about soft T-shirts or whatever, or like you could get them soft yeah. already when t-shirts were just boxy like they for whatever reason chlorine salt water yeah. washes sweat you know all of that just constantly for that six seven eight months yeah. like that made those things soft the magic formula people for soft t-shirts yeah. is <laughs> yeah. um never take it off only wash it when you have to and be in a pool and the ocean yeah. the same day every day for six months I think so. Because it's noticeable. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, it's definitely noticeable. Same thing with the UDT shirts. Oh, yeah. I thought like, mine always say, I guess they did, they must have gotten a little oh, yeah. uh, softer, softer, but I don't remember them ever being comfortable. No, they're not. They're canvas with so, one inch inseam. So I think, was it this like when you went through that they, you only, you were supposed to wear like the Speedo underneath the UDT shirts Nothing. in first phase, yeah. but not in second phase. Exactly. Because of the O2. O2. They're like, ah, oh, you'll create static and blow yeah. the place up. But I think, gosh, was it when I was there or did I just, was it the class before me? I can't, things have kind of blended a little bit. Um, but they had, I think CBS came out and I think, it was, yeah, that's right. It was uh, CBS came out and it was a few classes before me, uh, but the story was still there. And uh, the guys were told, I think it was first phase, maybe it was second phase. So they had brown t-shirts, not positive, but you can probably find it on YouTube. And, uh, and they went out there to do a morning PT session yeah. with CBS. Oh so they have the female <laughs> CBS can, lady, you know, doing their thing. And they got the, the cameras, you know, a couple cameras up front that are going to kind of pan across the grinders. The guys are, are working out for like B roll and she'll be talking to like the first phase, you know, yeah. O or chief or maybe the CO or whatever. And, uh, and so the guys are told to wear the Speedos underneath the UDT shorts. So yeah. for those who are listening, UDT shorts are very short. One inch. And insane. there's no sort of like gussety thing. It's just like, it's World War II. Yeah. It's like what you would have been issued in 1941, 42, 43. That's why they're 44. called UDT shorts. And uh, and so the guys get out there and you're like standing at attention, you know, and then uh, uh, PT starts and there's an instructor up on this platform in front of you and starts yelling at you what to do. And course good morning darlings oh, which yeah. is when you lie on your back and you open your legs, open your or legs. Like, yeah. <laughs> and uh your feet are a little bit off the ground or whatever supposed to be for the scabbard for the for the abs and uh and for the core and guess what they're not wearing <laughs> they're not wearing the speedo hello cbs uh-huh so i think all that had to be cut apparently so that was still a story when i got there like maybe a year possibly two yeah. uh years later after that point but um udt shorts not that comfortable i don't remember the name too comfortable yeah Wetsuits too. Wetsuits, we still had the ones that um, you pulled through beaver and you attached. Yeah, yeah, the beaver tail you attached up front with like a, a brass clasp or something. Yeah. Like that, that was some old school. Over your uncomfortable UDT shorts. So now you have the most uncomfortable sort of uh, the worst wetsuit. setup ever. <laughs> yeah, not, not great. Not great. But uh, um, man, yeah, that's good. Good yeah. memories. We didn't have that. We had the shorties zip good. up the back. Oh, so you had actual wetsuits. Yeah, we had wetsuits. Yeah, we still had the old school. Oh. Yeah, man. What kind of knife do you guys get? Um, I think we used, I think we had a SOG. Okay, so they switched. Yeah. Uh, they switched by then. So we had the old. Or no, uh, we had a cold Navy. steel. Okay, yeah. The cold black steel cold there. steel ones. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I apologize to it? everybody. No, um, I think mine got, I think they, that was, for whatever reason, that was some one of the things that they were like, give that back. Really? Yeah. <sighs> Come on. Oh, well. Naval Special Warfare. 
God. You guys can sport me a cold Seriously. Steel. I mean, ridiculous. That's probably somebody in charge that was just uh, not a knife guy. Yeah. You know? Or maybe he is a knife guy and then sold Ooh, them all on eBay. really a knife guy. <laughs> <laughs> Selling them right now on eBay, that guy. It's, it's, that's what he's doing. That's his retirement. Oh, man. So, uh, so you get that next chance and do you have to go back and do it again eventually? Like when you heal up and go yeah. and tie. Yeah. That, so I, I went through and they were like, good to go. Actually, I remember good saying the same thing again. Don't fuck this up. <laughs> and then I retested and it was fine. Nice. Um, and so then I came through and I finished class with two, seven, two. I was diving. It was great. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I think I failed pool comp once. Is Andy your instructor at this point? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, he is. Sorry. I apologize. Phase, yeah, yeah. Phase OIC, phase. or is he? Uh, or he was, is he? He was the OIC, I, I believe. Was he? Uh, he might have been. You had OCS by then. Oh yeah, he was an LT. Okay. So he's there. You I, got. I remember uh, it was like instructor stump, like Mister Stump. Okay, got it. Uh, how was uh, how was die phase? It was fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, cool. Oh, that was a good one. I like that. Yeah i I had fun. It was really cool. I'd never scuba dived or okay. done that kind of stuff before. Um, but it was a good time. Like, I mean. Now you're really learning something. Yeah, you're really learning something. Yeah, you they you they think that you have proven that you are comfortable in the water mm-hmm. through the things that you've done in first phase, and now here you are in second phase. Uh, and they're going to keep testing you, especially with uh, with uh, like buddy breathing and a few different things yeah. you have to do, and like waterborne stuff. Like we did um, that big open ocean mile, open ocean swim, that like six miler. You did it in second phase. I think we did, we did it, it in second phase. They used no, to do it in third. I, I think it, I think they've switched it around. Yeah, I can't remember where we did it. Um, Might have been second. But that was fun. Like, I had a swim buddy, Kevin Kaisiak, uh, who went to the academy, and the two of us smoked it. Oh, wow. Like, we ended up on that surfboard. That was cool. Like, the waterman board up there. So oh, really? It's fun to do those kind of activities. Did you do it in Coronado? Because I think they moved it we to did. the island at some yeah. point. Yeah, I think we did ours in Coronado, too, and we went south. We did. So we went from Coronado to the IB Pier and then That's flipped around. Else. Oh, you came back. Yeah. Gosh, so, I don't even remember. I think we it, just went. Yeah. I think we just, for some reason, I think we just went one way and we got out down there and then went to a party. Oh, yeah, yeah. We didn't do that. We got beat. Oh, our class didn't do so hot. Yeah, one of the guys was married, so he could have a house like oh, off base, and he perfect. lived in IB right by, um, right by the, what's that the bar down there? Uh, I'm losing my mind right now, but anyway, uh, Seal Bar down oh, there yeah, yeah. in IB, and uh, so I think we just started farther north. I want to say, and then mm-hmm. we just went all the way down. And yeah, probably like at the break water, water and, and then swam down. Yeah, it was yeah. a it was a, it was a good little good little push. It's a jaunt. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but that's good times. And then into third. How was third, third phase, phase for you? Third phase was cool. Um, we went there in November, December, so it was literally cold, mm-hmm. very cold. Uh, our class wasn't cold huge. up in the posta. Did you do navigation in the posta? Land yeah, out? it was cold there, and then um, and then the island was freezing. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay, yeah, I remember that. Okay. Yeah, we were kind of end of summer up in Waposta, so it was, yeah. it was hot, but I don't remember it being yeah. too crazy. It was it was cold, cool, yeah. uh, frost on the ground in the mornings, oh, wow. I believe, uh, but nothing crazy. Yeah, didn't get yeah. you can get snow up there. You can get snow up there. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, but yeah, we didn't have, we had, yeah we had end of summer, so not not bad. And then out to the island where no one can hear you scream, and you get to do some cool. Once again, here you go, touch point with World War II, uh, going out there and blowing obstacles yep. that uh, look exactly the same as what people have seen in mm-hmm. World War II movies. Haversacks. And yeah, exactly. Bangalore. Same thing. Same exact stuff. Yep. Um, probably some of it was actually manufactured, possibly. Almost certainly. You know? Some of those haversacks are from the 40s. Yeah. And, uh, but it's really cool. I love that because you're you're in your, your UDT shorts. I don't think you're even in a wetsuit. Um, and diving down and mm-hmm. then if you're this the buddy you're looking down yeah. watching um as, you're the guy that's down there tying, and in. tying in and you go as far as you can go is what mm-hmm. i as what I remember because you had to know the procedure how to do it, it all yourself i yep. think uh and that's however long you'd hold your breath and everybody was kind of different uh because everybody's you know you're fairly you're similar you know depth but still a little different here and there and everybody has a different capacity for breath holds yeah. and stress underwater and all that stuff but uh so you're watching from the top your buddy's going as far as he can go he pops up as he comes up you take that breath and you go back down and you're doing it but it's exactly the same as uh like the frogman the movie world war ii black and white um and that was pretty cool to do that and then to blow it oh yeah that was pretty sick nothing's quite like watching a 40 foot stream of water come out you know seven or eight different places seriously i hope they still do that stuff i I hope i think that's a little touch point with history i think they had mentioned that they were they don't have any more Bangalores or something. Oh, really? They might have yeah, run out yeah. of no, World I, War II I, era munitions. I don't know if I'm making this up or if I recall one of the staff saying, yeah. "Oh, yeah, you know, we're going to run out of Bangalores at some point." Yeah, like, and he was being serious. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 
That was because that was cool. That was cool. Because now you have something in common. You have buds in common. You have Hell Week in common. Um, but you also have something in common, not just with that, but with what something that guys did, like at the oh, yeah. inception. I mean, that naval special uh, warfare, hydrographic recon with yeah, yeah. freaking lead, lead, lead line, line and slate, lead line and slate. <laughs> That's something else you have common with. You know, it's it's cool to, that they still do that. Yeah. Like, hey, this is where you come from. Yeah. I like that. And then uh, when do you find out you're going to, well, you go to SEAL qualification training. or yeah. CS- We went to SQT at yes. the time. Yeah. Um, so when I went through, we went to, about this, we went to jump school first. So in-house? Like, yeah. The okay. in-house program. Uh, and then however the rest of it panned out. And I think we finished with land warfare. How was jumping? It was great. Did you know it was going to be a thing for you going forward? Absolutely not. Really? And then uh, years later when I ended up on the jump team, those guys that I was in jump school with um, actually laughed and said, hey, it's kind of weird that you ended up the jump team because um, I almost died in jump school. I had a Cypress fire okay, because I had on the very last like, kitchen sink jump, so you're wearing everything. Oxygen mask, weapon, so rock, full combat OG, equipment. Yep. At night, the full, you know, whole get up. Um, I had a horseshoe on my arm. A horseshoe Ooh. is the pilot chute wrapped around my arm. Well, because they're pin driven and not bridle driven bags on the mains. Okay. The main came out, but didn't unbag. So the lines are floating around. It's kind of all over the place. It's dark. Oh. I have 24 jumps. So I'm basically an expert, you know, as far as the Navy's concerned. Wow. And I couldn't get to my cutaway. And I thought for sure, like, if I didn't cut this main away, uh-huh. that if the reserve fired, from a Cypress, which is an automatic activation device inside of the reserve. It'll fire at a designated altitude to save your life if you're knocked out or something like this goes on. Well, I thought, hey, these lines are all over me. I, it'll get tangled. I'm going to die. This is it. Like, how did I go through all this bullshit? And now I'm about to die. And I said some other very choice phrases often <laughs> for about 30 seconds, whatever it was. And I don't remember when it happened, but that thing did fire. And I did not get the main cutaway because wow. my arm was pinned up in the air. I could only use my left hand. It's dark. You know, you have no two mask. It was the old like elephant hose, mm-hmm. um, elephant trunk with yep. two masks. I think I grabbed the hose, riser, this, that. I was basically as close to panic as I think I've ever been. Yeah. I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? Dude. Reserve goes. I look up and, you know, I have risers. And then it looks like an hourglass because the main had wrapped around the middle of it. And then it was clean, deployed reserve. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm alive. <laughs> and I have a very distinct memory of looking up and seeing the reserve with the flashing strobe uh-huh. because we were strobes on our helmets, right? I distinctly remember seeing that and then looking around. And we're at Ote in San Diego. And I look around. I'm like, where's the drop zone? Oh, it's over there. Kind of grab a riser and try and turn that direction to get where I'm going. I'm pound into a hill because that thing deploys it to whatever it is 2500 feet i think for those um M- so, you, was it, so your, your landing was a surprise oh huge surprise did not know it was going to happen boom ground rolled down a hill oh uh, my maybe 100 yards or so I land on the ground and i'm on the, i'm like right on the road collect the parachute do the wily coyote like oh man is everything everything still works it's insane would you have a ruck you were supposed to drop i did a ruck and a weapon in O2. And looking back on it, I think that actually saved my back and my legs from being broken. Wow. Cause it kind of like braced you. Mm-hmm. I think I was totally braced. Oh, so I had like kind of a twisted ankle, um, and rope burn. Hey, I'll take it. Oh, I pulled the reserve into my feet. And right when I got it to my feet, a car came whipping around the corner. Like I almost got hit by a car. Oh my God. For real. Remember hot shots part two. Yes. <laughs> oh, like that's basically Charlie. Is it Charlie? She, who, when the, guy, happened. the guy gets hit by the car after uh-huh. all the, uh-huh. Oh, uh-huh. My. that was about, the ambulance, that right? Was Isn't it the ambulance? Yeah. Oh my gosh, dude. That was about me. Um, and then I called in and they came and retrieved me and that was the last jump at jump school. Did they count it as a, yeah. Wow. I'm like, well, I mean, <laughs> you already graduated. They got successful. You walked away. Not dead. Yeah. Jeez. Looking back now that you have all this experience, um, would you go back and replay that and think about that? And were what usually happens or, or when you're in a situation like that in that reserve? Yeah, and I've and had fires. I've had twelve reserve rides now. Um, well, I was on the jump team and we do but, crew, um, so it's not that bananas. And I fly wingsuits. And there's other reasons. Oh, I'm going to ask you about all this insanity oh, yeah. in a minute. But um, yeah, I've looked back on it. There's only one thing I could have done different, really, which is have more jumps and know what to do. 
what what were you, what are you, what are you supposed to, I mean, you're supposed to. So what I would have done looking backwards is um, this arm's pinned. Yeah. I probably would have taken the mask off and taken my glove off because I was wearing a glove if I had the, the time or just gone with the glove and grabbed three ring and riser and followed that seam all the way down of the harness to the cutaway. Cause I couldn't find the cutaway with all the all like stuff on you ruck attachments and stuff and lines, rifle, and rifle sling. on the, and sling, like all this crap that was all over me. That's what hung me up. So I grabbed like main lift web, O2 hose. You, and you only have 30 seconds a minute to figure the shit out before that goes off the AAD. So yeah, in retrospect, I, I might've just like grabbed something and tried to follow it down and get that figured out. But wow. Was your worry about what was going to happen if that Cypress fired? Um, was that I was bl- I was blindly lucky. It was like what usually happens in that situation. You die. Wow. You, you have a double malfunction. You hit the ground because it wraps. Mm-hmm. Doesn't deploy. I I was just blind luck, which is what the riggers told me on the ground. Like, wow, you are so lucky. Wow, yeah. Dude. Most double mal's result in in complete fatalities. Yeah. yeah, my best friends. Um, that happened to him. He was one of the first people to go through uh, a free fall that wasn't army. Yeah, free fall. I think it was they were testing it out then in two thousand, and uh, um, I have to go back uh, and really look. But uh, he had a double malfunction and and, and died. Uh, and then yeah, they sent me and his other best friend to uh, free fall the next week. So you know, it's, I mean, it's interesting. It, it it is interesting, but it's also one of those like. This is the job you signed up for. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, hey, you're going to continue training. Yep, no, right? exactly. It didn't. Uh, and looking back, I'm like, I'm glad that it didn't. They didn't let me fester for yeah months and months and months. No. Um, and they asked me if I if I wanted to do a jump, but I was kind of banged up, and they like the med staff were like, Nah, let's not have him do one more yeah. the next day because there's like a fun jump after. Oh, uh, they do a little Hollywood. Yeah, like a little Hollywood. You're clean, but yeah, just flight suit type thing. We jump into flight suits. Um, yeah. The Hollywood ones. Uh, man, that is crazy. But I ended up, I, I liked skydiving already. Yeah. Like I, I had already decided this was really cool. That was, that was a very scary event, but it wasn't a detractor for me wanting to learn to skydive. Yeah. For real. So I did my transition jumps like maybe a week later. So for a, uh, yeah. a license? Is yeah, for an A license and then started jumping a bunch while I was at SQT. Oh, no kidding. Do you time, have a group you guys did that? Yeah. And at the time they let us do it. I think okay. now they're not allowed. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like Patrick Swayze in Point Break. You know, he went up and learned how to jump, and he Very was jumping. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then I think there was, I think they didn't want him to jump as much as he was or something like that, because obviously uh, they wanted to finish the movie. Yeah. I don't know. And then you have Tom Cruise jumping off this friggin' cliff in Norway oh, with yeah, the motorcycle. Trained by a friend of mine, Miles really? Stasher. Uh-huh. Oh, oh, it's pretty wow. cool. He did, shit, what, that little doc that they put out about it? It's like 12 jumps or something. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And he did, he did a great the bottom, job. And then flying back up in the helicopter, another motorcycle, obviously, yeah. is there and do it again. Wonderful. And, uh, really cool. Incredible. Yeah. At, is, is he 60? Shit, he's got to be. 60, he's 62. Somewhere 61? in there. And he is just crushed. It was a great movie, by the way. I went oh, yeah. and then saw it. And uh, they did a fantastic job with it. There was a, there's been a few movies lately that have had some train sequences. And uh, the train sequence in Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1, is pretty cool. Oh, it cool. is pretty good. I'll, I'll they do a, yeah, they do a great job with it. But uh, I thought but, the one in Extraction 2 was yeah. wild, too. Yeah, like this the, was, because I obviously I was watching that as mm-hmm. well. Uh, Chili Palmer, who's been on here, former Delta guy, uh, does work on those films. Uh, so I watched that, and they did an awesome job with it. Yeah, and, super cool. Uh, this was like, this one was a little, was unique. I didn't, I didn't cool. expect uh, what I was going to, what, what happened. So I'm stoked to see uh, it. So check, yeah, definitely check that out. But uh, yeah, that's pretty, that was pretty cool of him to do that and to go off this cliff with a motorcycle over and over and over again to get the shot good for him man so wild but uh so so you're jumping on your own Mm -hmm. you're liking it and uh make through sqt and where do you go you when at what point do you find out you're going to sdvs um about a month before graduation i think uh maybe a little of sqt or buds of sqt of sqt yeah, actually, I think maybe a little bit before that, we found out what team we were going to. Did you request to go there? Nope. I was sent <laughs> to team five. Okay. And then they voluntold. After you got to five? The class, no. Oh. Before graduation. I already okay. met my LPO. Really? Yeah. And then a couple of weeks out from graduation, they voluntold like the last couple guys in the alphabet. Like, well, we didn't get any volunteers, so you guys are going to SDV. 
Military right there. Okay. Yeah. Guess we're going to Hawaii. Wow. Yep. Okay. And for those listening or watching, what's uh, what is SDV? Seal delivery vehicle. And it's a just over 20 foot submarine. It's wet. It's a wet submersible. So you're wearing scuba or some sort of rebreather. And uh, we get in those things for everything from minutes to half a day. Wild. Yeah. It's an that, interesting uh, thing. <laughs> Yeah, they have one on, on display uh, a few different places, I think, but at the uh, UDT at SEAL Museum yeah, yeah, they they in Fort there. Pierce, Florida. And that's a great for anybody that's interested in special operations. You should definitely head down to the UDT SEAL Museum down there in Fort Pierce. It is a well worth spending a full day. The helicopter. Um, there it's inside. Yeah, really they cool. did a great job yeah. with with all of that. Uh, really cool, really great crew down oh, yeah. there. It's um, put together so nice. Yeah, they did an amazing, amazing job with it. So everybody should check that out. But you can check out an SDV. Yeah. And it's right there. I think all the controls and stuff, I think, are out of it. But uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's something that very, I don't know how many people volunteer to go to SDV in the teams. I don't think I've ever heard of any. <laughs> I'm sure there's our couple, but I don't know any either. Because we asked one of the staff members who was a second phase guy what it was like. Because, I mean, there's no information about it. Right. Especially then, 2007. Yeah. Like there's no... yeah, way less information about that. And I think even today. It, they're that, the most secretive yeah, of all the 100%. teams for good reason. Uh, uh, to include our, yeah, to include our yeah, other over there. brothers on the East Coast. Yeah. Uh, we, don't, we don't name names for for whatever reason. Like, well, I know for the reasons, yeah. but SDV. Like, I think the the last secrets left. I think in special operations, I think reside Underwater. out there at that command. Yeah, yep. yeah. And I don't. I don't know. I was never there because once again, I did not volunteer to go. Neither yeah. did anyone else that I know. Well, my, it makes sense that nobody has because we asked one of the staff members. Okay, Instructor Marcus, what's it like? And he goes, I don't know. You ever like curled up in a fetal position in a closet with a scuba regulator and sat there for eight hours? I'm like, what the hell is he talking about? Like, that's what it's like. like oh my God, I definitely don't <laughs> think this is a good idea. Right. Yeah. Oh man. So you're in this thing. I mean, you are crunched into these You can things. be pretty crunched in. You can have a lot of room depending on how it's set up and what kind of gear you're wearing. Yeah. Um, you end up becoming very comfortable with it. Really? Uh, and I left that team with more than a thousand hours of Dive time. Incredible. Which is relatively common. Yeah. For guys that are coming from there. Jeez. Um, I mean, I picture it as, you know, like, like, like you, you described it, but, uh, also add obviously wet, cold, mm -hmm. unable to really move. Maybe oh, yeah. let's say if you're the, uh, if you're the passenger, uh, and you're a part of the SR element and yep. you're not driving or flying the thing, uh, and you're back just waiting to get to your drop off point. It's in the dark. Yeah. You don't know what's going on. And you're hearing things. And when people also, you just if you have the motor, whoop, whoop, oh, whoop, 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 man, 10 hours. And if you're under something, I don't know if you like, like you're just diving oh, under yeah. it in a Harbor, there are some odd noises going on. There's some weird shit out there. Yeah. yeah. There's some crazy noise. It's like, you're like outer space type noises Oh yeah, and it's odd. And when you're under a ship, it's even weirder. Everything's humming, clicking, banging. Uh huh. It yeah. is odd. It is odd. It is crazy. But uh, you go to the command first and then go to the school? How does that no, work? No, so they, they, I think that that's what they do now. <coughs> um, they've sort of collected everything and put it all in Hawaii. At the time, the school was in Panama City Beach, mm. in Florida. So we went to school there. I think it's, I think it was eight weeks. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we drove out there. Uh, me and a buddy drove out there, uh, went through the school, did the schoolhouse thing. And then got sent to Hawaii, and my check-in date was December seventh. No kidding. Yeah, in, in Hawaii, which I I hope That's is wild. I hope that was manufactured <coughs> by whoever you know was writing the schedules. Doubt it. Um, yeah, I doubt it. I mean, I like my graduation date from Hell Week was June sixth. No kidding. It's like there's a couple That's few wild. dates in there that are kind of neat. That is wild. Um, those two are kind of cool for me. Yeah. Yeah. I graduated buds the day before my birthday. Nice. Yeah. Nice. It was quite the party. So how was uh, how was school? How was SDV school? Um. Like any other school in the Navy, uh, basically a gentleman's course. You know, they're not trying to screw with you too bad. Like yeah. You already have your bird. Um, and it's like guys at STV don't really get quote unquote hazed or pushed around or any of that. Reason being, and most of the guys from that team will tell you the same thing. The boat hazes you more than enough. Mm. Just being in the water that much is enough of a struggle on people. Mm. They don't need to be pushing guys yeah um so the schoolhouse pushes you in that way and you're learning very basic 
driving skills of the SDB, um, diving tables. You're learning all the rigs, all the rebreathers and other stuff that we use. Yeah. Did you, uh, do you run into things? You're bouncing into pylons and you bounce into into shit so much. Oh man. Yeah. Boats, pylons, the ground. What's it like flying that thing? It's weird. Um, you have a screen about this far from your face. So I was a primary pilot. So I, I was a primary pilot the entire time I was there. Uh, I mean, I was a secondary pilot, my first platoon, and then ended up as a primary pilot and then continued as a primary pilot. Man. You have a screen about right here and a stick like on a Cessna between, yeah. between your legs. And then you yeah. can control the speed and the ballast and everything else with this, this hand. And that's, you're watching a screen driving like the at, an asteroids, basically like that asteroids video game. Mm-hmm. That's what it looks like. Old school. Do, 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 uh-huh. yeah, and you're watching sonar and it's, um, it's a wild experience. It's like yeah. for any pilots out there, it's like flying instrument rating the entire time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause you're Can't in see the shit. dark looking at the screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the guys in the back just got to hold on. Oh, they like no you idea. just got to trust. You're just in there. And if you're in the back, you're locked in. You can, but you can feel this. Oh yeah, like you know if you're going up or down. And you're like, what the is this driver doing? And or most, is this pilot yeah, doing? And that's what'll happen. Is that your crappy pilots, the mission specialists, the guys in the back, be like, what the hell, man? Like, what was that shit? Uh-huh. Yeah, and then the good pilots are very solid, and everybody uh-huh. knows the dive profile, so they usually know where we are. Kind uh-huh. of like, oh, we just took a hard turn. Oh, we're taking another one. But imagine if you know that in the back and you're in the dark and you're wet and you're on hour seven and uh, you're crunched in there. You're going to get yeah. dropped off somewhere. You, let's say you're doing a training exercise. Mm-hmm. Let's say Washington State or somewhere cold. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and we and did it there like, a bunch. You're like, uh, I don't, this does not seem like the right profile. And why is this guy, you call it porpoising? What are you doing? What is this? Yeah, that would yeah. be porpoising. And uh, you're like, what, did we just do an excursion? Like how, how deep do we just go right there? And exactly. now you're trying to clear your ears again. Oh. That's brutal. It's a it's an interesting brutal experience. Yeah, yeah, and people panic. I've I've heard of people panicking in the back. Yeah, yeah, I bet. just kind of having like a freak out moment because yeah. it's claustrophobic. Oh yeah, yeah, it seems awful. Yeah, like I described before. Yeah. Now imagine getting in that closet with like four of your best friends and filling it full of water. It and, almost seems worse. It's, it's terrible because you're like, like people bumping you. Me? And, yeah, yeah. And you know if you're on scuba, like sometimes people bump your regulator out. Like there's all sorts of stuff going on back there. Yeah, that sounds not which isn't what's happening in the front. It's just me and then a chief or an LT. How comfortable do you get over time as a as a pilot um, doing that that um, job? Very comfortable. Do like, you uh, to the point where like if we were bottomed out somewhere, like I've taken naps. What mm-hmm. underwater? Oh yeah, it's not that uncommon for guys, Dang. especially on full face masks. Do guys in the back sleep? Oh yeah, Dude. everybody goes to sleep. Why not try and rest? I don't know if I'd be able to do that. You'd be surprised. Cause I, cause guys in helos would, yeah. would rest oh, yeah. and I never, I never would. Um, I was always thinking about the mission. Yeah. Um, always like going through contingencies, always going through, okay, where are we? If the helo went down right now and I look over and I'm like, these guys are sleeping. Well, in those you know? flights, but those flights are what hour, two hours, maybe it depends. Yeah. Ours are like 10. Yeah. Like guys, you need something to do. Right. Yeah. Dude. Some guys, very short helo flights would, fall asleep um yeah, that was th- always shocking to me i remember i'm like bro we're flying like 25 minutes like how are you taking exactly how are you taking a nap exactly this we're, thing is loud. we're going within the city here yeah. and uh but then coming back you're thinking okay we got this prisoner or whatever you have or person under control or whatever you're detainee um going through the, the the next phase of what's what's going to happen or what could happen um so yeah and my mind was always going yeah you know and same thing was weird like going to let's say shaw's or a place like that for whatever reason, oh, I, could I never could never go to take naps during. Well, I mean, I could shots. never go to bed at night until until all the guys were back. Uh-huh. It was a weird. I just I don't know what it, what it was. Like I'd be like, okay, so and so still missing, which could mean a few different things. A lot of them good, um, some of them <laughs> not. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's like it's like being a you know like at home, like your mm-hmm. like, kids are still out. Where are they? And you know, just can't go to bed kind of thing until they're there everybody's back and kind of accounted for but yeah but uh that's crazy that people get so comfortable underwater five six seven eight hours to sleep down there with you everything know, going on some of the stuff you don't think about is like you don't get to eat or drink water wow yeah so you get dehydrated you get hungry you can lose a lot of weight on those dives like you can wow. lose seven eight nine pounds of water weight yeah jeez and so in the back, you have a, did you ever do the SR stuff in the back? Or you kind yeah. of cross Everybody train? does both. Okay. Um, but if you're a good pilot, they want you up front a lot. Yeah. yeah. 
Did some people try not to be so great so they could go in the back? And no, like, some people just are terrible at it. There's, you don't have to try to be like, people it's, are going to be it's bad. It's not an easy thing to fly. No, it sounds it's all by hand. very difficult. It's all by feel. All by feel. Uh, yeah. Wow. That's very cool. I'm doing some research for this next novel on a plane. Um, the early versions were late 40s, but really came into its own in the mid 70s. Um, and uh, an amphib type type plane, the, everything that I'm reading about it oh, and cool. um, listening to people talk about it. It's uh, they're always talking about the feel like the pelicans. It's uh, it's a Lake Buccaneer, ah, um, Buccaneer. and it's a really cool uh, airframe. And mm-hmm. I read about it in a book when I was about, about the same time. Maybe I read about it the summer before I read Last of the Breed, but uh, I always wanted to incorporate it in the book, in a book, because the book that I read back yeah. then in 1985 uh, was so impactful. Oh, and it was cool. one of those ones that was like cementing my future path, both into the military and as an author. And uh, and I always wanted to incorporate it. And so this uh, this latest book has that. But they're, they're talking about the feel. Like here's all the, you know, the procedures and the, the pre-flights and, and all that stuff. And I'm trying to figure, I'm, I'm, I'm um, looking for somebody that I can actually touch. talk with, but uh, that, it, that flies these things because they have their, like a very small group of people fly these planes. Well, and I can uh, link you up with a, a beaver pilot that flies a float. It's plane. close. I mean, that's, that's closer. He, he might, he might know somebody that yeah. does, yeah but he would definitely be able to relate. That'd be planes. awesome. Yeah. That'd be awesome. I think I'm going to reach out to a few different people yeah. and then see which, who's available mm-hmm. and uh, ask them, Hey, read this. Does this make sense? Cause it's all academic. Yeah. Is this to wrong? Me. Yeah, yeah, it's all academic to me. I think I'm close, but uh, I want them to put thing like tell me things that only somebody who flies the Lake Buccaneer would know. Would know. Exactly. So even though let's say there's a hundred people that fly these in the country, and it might be less. Yeah, but right, um, right is right. Those people read it. I want one of those people to read it and be like, oh, yeah, he talked to somebody. I wonder who he talked to. Hell yeah. to get this right. So hence the the feel made me think of that. Bob, were you but, on the uh, phone with this? Yeah, idiot? yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so you had the feel. You're feeling this thing. Um, I was good. I was good yeah. at it, and then you develop a feel. Uh, there were better pilots, you know, and there were worse pilots. Everybody's yeah got their own shtick. Amazing. And then what do you do when you drop these guys off? If you're if you're a pilot and you have the SR element in the back and you're, let's say you're training in Washington State off the coast, and off, so the, boom, off they go. Often you can go with them and you're doing the mission too. Where do you put the the very expensive a piece place. of equipment? Like we have ways to keep it okay. where it needs like to be. Like anchor it or whatever somewhere yeah. and off you go. Yeah. And there's ways to find it again, which is, you know, interesting and cool. Yeah. So the ASDS. So in, two, <laughs> in 2000... <laughs> I, uh, uh, my platoon Mm -hmm. was voluntold that we're going to be the ASDS platoon. Oh man. And so for those listening, that's, I think it's one of the first Naval Special Warfare specific, maybe the only Naval Special Warfare specific dry sub. Yep. Out in Hawaii. I was always wondering like why SDV isn't voluntold to do this. What I mean, obviously they, they were very heavily involved in it, but what is my, I think we're just passengers. Why me? Now looking back, I think we were just supposed to be like, like. Uh, crash test dummies in the back, yes. like weight and gear Almost and certainly. all that stuff. Um, and so I forget how big it was because I never saw it because they cut the platoon in two. Huge. And half of us went to Hawaii to do that stuff. The other half, I think we went to Alaska and uh, and Washington State and did the uh, kind of like SR and all that sort of sort yeah. of thing. But half the platoon went out there and uh, and did did that job. And it was experimental, right? Oh yeah, it was like experimental. So all people this, can look all it up. That stuff is experimental. Yeah, people can look it up because it. <laughs> It was extremely expensive and burned to the ground at some point. I forget what year yeah. it burned to the ground. Uh, before you got there, right? A little bit before. A right before years you got before. there. Okay. I want to wish veteran Wally King a very happy 100th birthday. And want to thank everyone from that greatest generation, the World War II generation, who fought and sacrificed so much for the freedoms that we enjoy today. At Navy Federal Credit Union, every day is Veterans Day. That's why they're proud to have served the military community for over 90 years. Their employees are part of the community they serve. Many of them are veterans themselves. They serve more than 2 million veterans, so they understand the needs of veterans. They provide resources like Best Careers After Service to help veterans transition to civilian life. They're a top VA home loan lender. They offer award-winning 24-7 stateside member service. Use the hashtag gratitude mission to thank a veteran and honor their service. Your service inspires ours. Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash veterans. Insured by NCUA Equal Housing Lender. Let me tell you about First Form. 
They have amazing products. My personal favorites are the protein sticks and the micro factor daily nutrient packs. And why do I like them so much? Because first form makes it super easy to get quality protein and nutrients on the go. And I always seem to be on the go. While their products are top-notch quality, what I like the most about them are their values. First Form is so much more than a supplement company. They are deeply committed to both American jobs and your personal well-being. At First Form, they value people. In fact, the only thing they've automated is a tape machine, a symbol of their dedication to providing jobs and making lives better. They care about employing people, nurturing their growth, and genuinely improving lives. Their mission is simple. First Form is there to help you reach your fitness and wellness goals. They believe in a partnership where if you meet them halfway, they'll help you make progress. Go to firstform.com slash jackcar to receive free shipping on any orders over $75. That's one, the number one, S-T-P-H-O-R-M dot com slash jackcar. Once again, that's one, the number one, S T p h o r m dot com slash jack car and receive free shipping on any orders over seventy five dollars. All right, SDVs in the back of that thing, leaving it uh, going off, doing SR, coming back, heading back to wherever you are. How's lock in, lock out of the sub, and all that sort of thing? Uh, it's super cool, um, and as opposed to like what we were talking about right before we took the break, like the dry boat with oh yeah asds yeah we were talking about ASDS. asds what did it stand for do you remember i don't remember advanced swimmer delivery system maybe yeah, we'll go with that we'll go with that um how did it burn what happened with that so the batteries um for that system as well as for the sdv are caustic uh, i think i'm trying to remember what they were made out of uh, potassium i can't recall precisely um if they get wet they let on fire and I believe that the system that monitored that failed. And so the whole thing went on fire and, yeah. and blew up. And there was like batteries shooting through the roof. And wow. From what I was told, it was terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing just lit on fire. It's a wow. And it was, uh, was there only one of them? One. It was one. And they, you, they got uh, quoted by uh, Northrop Grumman to make another one. And I think they balked at the number. Yeah. Right. It was an expensive program. I think it was like on par with some sort of like space sort of a yeah. program. That kind of, those kind of numbers. Yeah. We're talking serious. Serious monies. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that thing, as soon as it burned to the ground, I think it was like, up oh, and then we'll. Yeah. They shifted focus to a different kind of thing. platform. Yeah. Um, and then we just kept doing our STV thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that I kind of was like, ah, you know, if I, if I put as a sign to go out to the uh, ASGS, obviously I would have done it. But uh, I was not disappointed when I got to go to Alaska <laughs> and uh, in Washington State and continue doing, yeah, no you know, that sort of thing rather than being a passenger crash test dummy in the uh -huh. ASGS. Which that's, that's sort of what it felt like at the command. Um, there was like a joke floating around that uh, it's like being a U2 spy pilot. Mm. Like, from the outside looking in, it might look really interesting and cool, yeah. but from the inside looking out, you're probably just exhausted and uh, full of anxiety and getting yeah. wrecked all the time. Wow. Yeah. Man. And how's, how's being on an actual sub when you had to go on actual subs and then lock out and go into the dry deck shelter and do all it's that stuff? It's kind of cool yeah. um, for a very short period of time. Yeah. Neat to visit. Wouldn't want to live there. Yeah. Uh, so I got to spend time on the Ohio, the Michigan, the Florida, the Kamehameha. Um, those are different classes of subs, but the really big ones are the boomers are super cool. I mean, yeah. the thing they don't even fit in football stadiums. They're oh, huge. Wow. They're hundred, many hundreds of feet long. Wow. There are three or four stories tall on the inside. They have full gyms. Like it's, it's an interesting wow. platform. Yeah. Um, and I've spent a month on one. Okay. And locking in and out is really very cool. I mean, there's yeah. some, there's some experiences that I look back on mm -hmm. when I was in the teams that I can never forget that I'm shocked that I can look back and go, Oh, I really did that. Huh. Like one of them is a, a separation drill on the back of the submarine. Okay. So we would go to the surface and hang out on top. And then, um, this boat would literally do a, a J turn and come back facing us. And we'd be looking and see the periscope. And then when it got to a certain distance, I don't recall the distance. I want to say it was like 50 or hundred yards out in front of us. You'd swim straight down hit the deck of the boat underwater 
and then it's not going very fast, two knots or something. And as you're coming by the dry deck shelter, it's open. The door is open, and you would swing into the back of it, and grab a, a rope, and pull yourself into the dry deck shelter. Wow. Really, really cool. You could start. Like, yeah, what, what do you have on? Scuba gear. Dang. If you're in the boat. For us, I think we were on, uh, we, uh, we were on breath holds. So it's like, you should dive down so on you did breath that hold. on breath hold. Yeah, yeah. It's oh. only, you're 27 feet down. It's not Still. Dark. No, that's for people who have gone in the open ocean, into the dark, kicking down. It's super cool. That's, wow. Yeah, so doing that in broad daylight in Key West is wild. Because it's, you know, awesome. incredible visibility. No doing way. it at night's a little nerve-wracking, but. Yeah, I would think. Yeah. Jeez. So what do you do? You go into that dry deck shelter, and then what do you do once you get in there? Then they, uh, you wait until they close the door, and then they pump the water out, and you can lock in. That sounds interesting. It's interesting. Dude. That is crazy. It's a cool experience. Yeah. How do you get in there? Like when you're locking out. Uh, so you go up one of the converted missile tubes. Um, so one of the like nuclear ICBM missile tubes. They convert it and it's big enough for like you and I yeah. to be like face to face. Oh, geez. And maybe like a scuba tank between us. Uh, it's about that much room to move around um, in the lockout door area. And once you get in there, it's a little bit wider. You might be able to fit like... Uh, a motor, like an outboard motor in there, uh -huh. which we did. We would pass them up and down. Wow. It's claustrophobic. Yeah. Is it dark? It, uh, no, but there's like a, either a white light or a red light, depending on what we're doing and why and what time of day. And, um, it's, it's terrifying. Like, yeah, it sounds the, it. the actual lock in, lock out specific area, uh, -huh. um, is big enough for two, maybe three people. I'm trying to remember this. And there's just like a door above you and a, a door below you. And yeah. you basically get shut in and they fill it full of water. Yeah. Or they drain it right of all the water. Man. It's it's a wild experience. Gosh, so I did some research last book for only the dead um, dry deck shelters, but it was in is an Israeli sub. They are very secretive about their submarines and their capabilities and all that sort of a thing. But uh, I found out that their dry deck shelter was built by a company. I want to say in I want to say it was Italy. I'm pretty sure. I have to go back and back and look. Mm -hmm. uh, so and then I went to that company's website and looked up all the stuff about that dry deck shelter and how many people and all that sort of a thing. And so I put that, you know, I, I did as good uh, of research as I could into something that they're very close hold about yeah. in Israel. Um, but, uh, but so doing that research for, for that book, I'm like, Oh man, crazy. Well, I caught the references. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, I, and I'd, read, I'd read that book about, uh, what is it? Shat 13. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Flotilla thirteen. Um, yeah, the Green Island mm -hmm. raid and and all that. And incredible. I think I texted you. I was like, oh yeah, I love the record. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I try to get as close as I as I can on some of those things. But man, that is wild that you were at that command and did those things. And then did you deploy? I know their deployments aren't necessarily the same types yeah, of we, deployments we were, as the SEAL team. We were doing stuff, um, and we actually got to do some some cool work and. Nice. Um, I'm really glad I was there, you know, got to do kind of what, what is the very end of, um, being a frogman? Like nice. there aren't that many guys doing the whole yeah. frogman stuff. Um, and in 11 and 12, I deployed as an augment, um, to one of the squadrons in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Nice. Yeah, so That's got, right. Got to do that. That's that good. That's a good pump. Freaking fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Four months. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. So I did their, we did their whole deployment. That's awesome. Yeah. I yeah, got to do so that in 2003. God, that's a, you get a learning experience, don't you? Yeah, that was great. It you was go fantastic. there and you're like, oh, this is what the pros do. Got yeah. it. That was awesome. Especially so early on. Uh, oh, yeah. In 2003, that was invaluable for, mm -hmm. for me going forward. But uh, what was the diciest thing you did at SDV? Oh, man. And then you look back on your like, I am glad I only had to do that once or uh, man, I am glad I never have to do that again. Or I hope I never have to do that again. I mean, there's a whole, a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Um, we got recovered on the back of a boomer sub underwater and it was probably 30 foot down, you know, 25, 30 feet down. And it was at the very limit of a, a storm limit for up on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and it was terrifying. Like the yeah. boat was bouncing back and forth you're on, it's in the dark, you're this multi-ton submarine that, that I'm driving is now bouncing into this billion dollar submarine moving five, six feet up, down, left, right. And I have no control. The divers had hooked our leash to the boat and they're trying to tie it down. And, um, I believe somebody lost a finger that day, that night. 
tying the boat down. Like it just crushed them. Mm. It, it's a terrifying experience. I think we broke a, um, one of the bollards off of the side of the boat. Uh, that was terrifying because any sorts of things can go wrong um, yeah. when you're, when you're driving and attached to that boomer because there's a dude driving that boat. He, like they could have a breach. It does. It has happened. Like you could be on the back of that thing and they breach. And now you're just sort of tethered. Now the chances of that are slim to zero, but it's always going through your head. Like, Oh crap. Yeah. This could go really wrong. And it, humans really aren't meant to be underwater. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're already <laughs> left that this, a while ago. You're already in this environment. That's yeah. a little scary. Right. Yeah. So I'd say like of the stop of the stuff that I can really talk about. Um, Cause I mean, I take the, close to the cuff information mm-hmm. um, there, even just the stuff that would probably be fine to talk mm-hmm. about. I, I take it pretty seriously. So I'm just like, yeah, yeah. You know, keep, keep it vague, keep, keep it over there. Um, but that specifically is terribly yeah, terrifying. Man. <laughs> Did you do uh dry suit work too in some of those yeah. environments? Dry How's suit, semi dry, wetsuits. We did everything. Yeah. Um, dry suits are pretty crappy. They suck. Uh, but so do semi dries and that's like an eight mil, seven mil. Yep. Yeah, the coldest I've ever been is wearing a semi-dry. Okay. Which is a such a thick wetsuit that it slowly gets wet. Uh-huh. Um, I got out of the water and was like, I was hypothermic. Wow. Yeah. It, it was a mess. And I wish I still had my semi-dry suit from before I went in the in the Navy. I was doing some diving before I went in and had a semi-dry suit that I really liked back yeah. then. But um, I wonder they're, what it's they're like They're interesting, now. aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I was interested in it because I hadn't heard of it yet. And yeah. I was like, wait, what? I know dry suit. What is this thing? I know, exactly. Yeah. Um, Which, so. if anybody's curious why we used them, dry suits are great until they flood and then you're screwed. Semi-dries are fantastic because you get a lot of the benefit of motion mm. and warmth of a, of a normal wetsuit but not the fear of it flooding out. Yeah. You might be colder than in a dry suit, but you'll never run the risk of getting killed yeah. due to like a cold exposure, yeah. which is why we went with those. Nice. Mm-hmm. Man, so wild. And I know a buddy of mine was over there um, who's out now, but he's still pretty, pretty secretive about what he's done. Amazing guy. I went to Intel school with him and to buds with him. And um, then he went to SDVs before going to the East coast. Um, but they did something on the old property, the old Magnum property mm, uh, before, cool. before Obama bought it. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think they did a little mission profile <laughs> up there and, uh, and that, that was pretty cool that they got to, to do that before it's uh, before the secret service took it over <laughs> <laughs> and started protecting it, I guess. Um, and I think they, they, did you ever do that? Did you ever go over there? No, no. we didn't. It's uh yeah, pretty cool. I think I looked at it on Google earth not long ago. Cause we we're in Hawaii with the family and I uh, wanted to go by and, and check it out. I need to do that next time. Does he have a but, Ferrari uh, parked up front? I don't think so. <laughs> but I mean, if you bought that property, you gotta kind of have gotta to get one. I mean, even come if on. it's like a junker, just yeah, get the outside I mean, looking 308 good. GT like, uh, man. Yeah, it would. Uh, leave, man. Leave, leave a tiger. He beat hat. me to it, and I don't even think when he bought it. I don't even think it was. Cr- I mean, everything's relative, right? I mean, if you were the, it's not crazy the, expensive. It wasn't a billion dollar property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so, man, he beat me by about a. I think he bought it when he was still in office. I oh, think for the last okay. couple of years, and they bought it. They tried to make it secretive, but everybody knew. Um, man, he beat me by a few years. Otherwise, you I would have had it. I think so. I don't think I could have passed it up. No. And how excited I am about Magnum and things from the 80s and that stuff. I don't think that, uh, I think my wife would have been on board. She for, for sure would have. Well, I knew it when you put that reference in there. In the, in the <laughs> there's a couple. Book, I texted yeah, there's a couple. You, like, uh, every, book oh, has, really? <laughs> every book has a, uh, a Magnum reference, some more yeah. subtle than others. Uh, very impactful show from my childhood. That one was but subtle-ish. How, uh, how cool would it have been to, to get that property? Absolutely. Man. Dang it. Next time. The Obamas. Well. Uh, I know he's listening right now. So if he wants to sell it, I'm sure you know, is. it's going to be more expensive now, but yeah, that's all right. That's, that's just how it goes sometimes. That's market value. It's yeah. Fun. That's how it goes sometimes. <laughs> but it's really cool. That my buddy who also grew up watching Magnum got to at SDV do a cool little training mission. That's over there really in cool. that area. Yeah. yeah. We got to, we got, got to do some cool stuff and do some really cool training missions. And uh, I mean, like that place lets you do things with people or groups or, uh, other SEAL teams that really you couldn't have participated yeah. in unless you were a member of SDV. Yeah. Um, it looks like it's a cool place to have um, 
it's a cool mission to have partaken in, to have been a part of for sure. No matter, Absolutely. I mean, it is a difficult mission from everything that you've said, from what I know about it, from, you know, friends, obviously, and right. the, the little touch points that I had with it while I was in, but I mean, nothing but respect for those guys. Very, that go da- over it's very dangerous. You know, like yeah. somebody was getting a dive injury or I think we had a fatality almost every year I was there, oh, man. Um, which it, you know, as well as I do that during a time of war, it, it's sort of the nature of the game. Like we were, we're all training right up to the edge, right? Like, uh, you know, guys had accidents. They'd follow to helicopters. They yeah. get hit by Humvees. Like, you need to operate really close to that edge to be on on the ball when you deploy. So it was the nature of the program. Yeah. Man, nothing but respect for those guys that go over there and do that. And I think is it, they were talking about uh, just through the grapevine through and just rumor mill, um, SDV2 coming back. Are they back, you know? I think there's a debt, not a debt. team. Okay. They'll never have a team again. Yeah. Not, I mean, Never say never, yeah, but never know. there's no reason to have a team again out there. Yeah, yeah so there's a debt out there mm-hmm. on the East Coast, yep. but um, kind of the, the main hub is Hawaii. Yeah, man, very cool. So anybody, SDV guys, or anybody that's going into the SEAL teams thinking about it, I mean, it's man, I, in a time I, when we're not like directly going to Iraq and Afghanistan and crushing it for uh, you know 20 years or being at SDV, my understanding is the now place. there's a screening process. Yeah. When I went, it was, uh, you get voluntold. Okay. I think they've actually. <laughs> it's probably wise to have a screening process. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I agree. How did, I wonder why it took so long. Like we might want to get people that want to be here that are, have the aptitude for it. Probably paperwork. Yeah. Oh man. But, uh, but yeah, I think when you're not in a, uh, a time of war, STVs might not be a bad place to be. I'd agree. Yeah, especially with... Uh, it's not a terrible place to live. What's going on? Yeah, why are you not Kind not of a cool bad? job. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Are you uh, jumping during this time? Or are you... Uh, what are you doing as far as I was as jumping stuff? a lot. Yeah. And actually, on your own and with the team? or Both, yeah. And we were sort of co-located with an AFSOC um, unit out there that did like SOC pack work. Mm. And we got to jump a ton. Nice. Because uh, there are, you know, the C-130s and the C-17s, they need to get recurrency for their jump masters, right? Well, there's only the one SEAL team there. So yeah. we're doing all the recurrency jumps for all the helicopters, all the everything. So we jumped probably more than anybody except the guys across the street. Yeah. You know, like at, at the command. Mm. Like we might have been doing the most amount of jumps. Nice. Um of any of the other teams. Are you uh are you falling in love with it? Or are you uh, uh yeah. yeah. I had immediately started skydiving a ton. Okay. Because by the time what five years later, by the time I went to the jump team I had five hundred and fifty, six hundred skydives. Okay. And a similar number of base jumps. Wow. Oh, you're just base jumping. Oh, yeah. Was there anything at the time that uh, written about whether you're allowed to base jump or not? No, but I definitely got told <laughs> not to. My uh, LPO in chief had me sign a chit. It's like, I will refrain from base Really? And, did you uh, tell them you were? Or did they find no, out that they you... they found out. And they pulled me aside afterwards. They're like, look, man, we get it. Please don't. Did you uh, adhere to this? Um, well, I mean, it said refrain. So I did my best to refrain. Okay, let's see. But I was jumping. <laughs> so. You just kept it on the down low? Yeah. Do you have a group that was do it? or is Yeah, there was like two or three guys. From the command? Um, from your, your, your No, command? actually, no other guys from the command. Um, there was a dude out there who had been at, uh, at CAG that was a, a buddy of mine. He was, ended up being my roommate. Nice. And then a guy. What was he doing out there? Uh, he was on some weird lat transfer billet. Huh. I don't know, like biding cool. time. Because um, he'd been over there. For like nine years or something, yeah. and then went somewhere else, and then came there, and nice. uh, and then an EOD guy. Okay, yeah. So and you guys were base jumping. Yeah. What were you jumping off of in Hawaii? Um, uh, you name the thing that's tall enough, and we'd give it a rip. Buildings, buildings, cliffs, cliffs. There's a couple cliffs. They're not very big or yeah. nice. Uh, there's like an antenna or two. Okay. Yeah. Are the antenna? What's what are the uh, most favored things to jump up from? Well, I mean, so I like buildings. Okay. Um, and I, how come? They're just cool, the whole process. Like having to get in? Yeah, having to get in there, um, hypothetically, and figuring out the winds and the, the micro weather that's going on in the streets uh. and not getting caught or seen. It's, the whole thing to me is very cool. What um, would you do? Would you have a uh, getaway vehicle stage? Yeah, you have a spotter and somebody down there. And it, by and large, you're really not doing anything destructive or causing any real issues, you know? Did uh did the cops ever? No. Nope. You know, is somebody uh, looking out down there, like looking also? Oh, yeah. Like, law enforcement. Giving know. us a holler. 
All right. So do our best not to have anything weird happen. Do you have somebody up top spotting too that then has to leave not by jumping? No, no. Okay, it's just you guys. Just leave. Yeah. (laughs) Man. And I I got into that because I saw a movie about a guy who owns um, and helped start an American based manufacturing company, uh, Apex Base. It's Todd Shubathen. And they did a documentary. It was a USC film school movie Mm. called Stealing Altitude. Okay. And it just blew me away. Like they are stealing altitude. Like they're not doing anything wrong. They're sort of like squirreling their way into these buildings yeah. in, in LA. And he's jumped like everything in Los Angeles. Wow. He was doing this in the mid eighties. Wow. Yeah. Dang. Really cool. And the videos on YouTube, you can find it. Stealing yeah. altitude. I think okay. Bart Starr maybe. Okay. It was a filmmaker, but really cool. And I saw that and I'm like, I need to do that thing. I need to do that. And the Navy was kind enough to teach me how to skydive. And then I learned how to base jump. <laughs> So skydive, you got your A license still in San Diego. Mm-hmm. Uh, where's your first base jump? Is it Hawaii? No, it was in California. Before you went out there? Um, like no, during after. Your time? After, while like, I was there. Well, yeah. Yeah. Where was it in California? Where'd you jump off of? It was a bridge. Nice. Which bridge? Eh. It's up north, near Tahoe. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, and then uh, after that, I took a little bit of a break. and then What was it like to jump from your first bridge? It was just kind of like a, it was almost like a stunt. Yeah, it was neat. I wanted to know what it was like, but it just okay. I didn't really understand the process. Okay, and when I went back to Hawaii, and I was already in the skydiving scene, they introduced me to what it was really like. And uh, here's how you pack the rig. Here's what you need. Go buy this, because um, at the time it wasn't all over the internet and everywhere. It was a little bit, but not this. I mean, Tom Cruise just did a base jump in a movie. You know, it wasn't this thing like that. Mm. You know, I think the only other base jumps had been there being two or three in the movies ever. Yeah. Right now it's become very ubiquitous with extreme sports. Spy who loved me. Bam. Seventies. We recreated that. Did you? Yeah. I did a ski base jump last year. No way. Recreating it. Last huh? year? Yeah. In Jackson. How did I miss this? I'll show you some videos. Yeah. And you, and you skied? Skied, off? skied right off. Man. Did you get the, uh, the Union Jack? No, nope, But it said at the time. So it said BRCC. Like nice. Big red, white, and blue. Yeah. It's really cool. So I, I wore the yellow ski suit and everything. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Nice. The whole was the rig yeah, uh, red? No, no. So you got close. You got a, close. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I had a red helmet and red boots, and we, oh, we gave it a go. That's know? awesome. Yeah, big red, white, and blue canopy. Nice. Yeah. Oh, man, that's so I'll, cool. I'll show you a video. Yeah. yeah. That is, I mean, that's a, that was an amazing stunt. Oh, yeah. It was super then. cool. Especially back then. And it was fun you know? to do, and ski base jumping is outrageously dangerous. Uh, yeah. Because you have to be a, a competent skier yeah. and a good base jumper. Right. And usually... It takes a long time to become either, mm-hmm. if not both, is n- not very common. There's a couple hands worth of people that have done multiple ski base jumps. Dude, do you did you click off the skis like he did in the? No, nope. uh, uh, you can keep them on now. Okay, yeah, because that 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 one I think who directed that John Glenn anyway uh, kicks off both mm-hmm. of those skis. Yeah. You know, and he did like a free fall, free fall. Yeah, he almost got hit by one of those skis. It looks close. You watch that video and it's like, whoa, whoa, oh yeah, whoa, whoa, right by that can big ground. Amazing. Yeah, but Amazing. Man. Um, learn how to base jump. Yeah. So that first one, who took you? Did somebody that had done that bridge before yeah, take yeah, you? Yeah. So ta- talks you through it. Talk you got you through your it. It was kind Boom. of a stunt. Okay. Afterwards, I went um, to the drop zone, and they really sort of uh, took me under their wing. Was, okay. Okay, he really wants to do this. Yeah, he I jumped get, off a bridge. He wants to get introduced to this, and this is what this is like, and this is what this is like. And okay. Here's why we pack like this. Here's why we use these rigs. Here's some people who do it all the time. Go out with them. I uh, did that. Yeah. I went to the bridge in Twin Falls, Idaho. Did about a half dozen jumps. Okay. Wow. Um, which you usually jump off a bridge first mm-hmm. because it's safe. You know, I'm putting quotes up. But yeah. It, it's safe enough. It seems safer. There's nothing to hit underneath it. Yeah. Cars. Um, except the ground. People. Yeah. Law enforcement. Sides of buildings. Yeah. Other gusts coming through. Everything. I mean, like, much, throw it's you much into safer. a building. And the yeah. one in Twin Falls is um, completely legal. They encourage people to jump there. Okay. There's lots of courses that go. People do tandems there. Nice. And so I went there, and then I went to Moab, jumped some cliffs, and then from then on, I just didn't stop jumping. Wow. Skydiving or um, base jumping. I Dude. was doing it a ton. And That's yeah. insane. What, what's your first building like? That was terrifying. Yeah? Oh, yeah. How did, how did you... Uh, how did you choose the building, and then uh, went, how did it go? I went with a, a mentor. Yeah. yeah. So they, he's like, "This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. Here's why." Okay. I'm like, okay, I'll just. You're a new guy. Like, just do, okay, I'll do what you what say. What time of day is there? A time of day that's preferred? Like Two a.m. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's a night jump always. <laughs> but there's lights. There's I lights. Guess. Oh yeah. I mean, you've walked around downtown. Yeah. Two a.m. It's always lights. Yeah. And nobody looks up. Yeah, but it's the same thing. Also with lights, like 
uh, depth perception and distance. Like, I don't know. I guess maybe you get good at it. You get good at it. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So first one, what are you, what are you thinking? Don't fuck this up. Yeah. (laughs) Cause there's so much that can go wrong. Yeah. You know, the littlest thing like, Oh, is my rig going to work? Is my, is my pilot shoe going to do the right thing? Am I going to push the right direction? Cause when you're doing these subterminal jumps, if you turn your shoulders a little weird or hips drop one direction, that'll affect the opening. You, you can turn and face the building or mm. face away or, and you know, I'm jumping a 400 foot building. So it's yeah. not that tall. Dude, you don't have a lot of time to figure out what's going to go wrong or if it goes right, get where you're going and you yeah. might have a seven to 10 second canopy ride. Yeah. That's something one popped up on my, Instagram, you know how it recommends things Mm -hmm. to you. Um, And uh, so it popped up and it's, I think it was three people jumping a bridge Mm -hmm. and uh, they kind of jumped at the same-ish time, whatever. Anyway, they pull, but I think the first person on the left, I think pulls and like goes out of frame, I think. And then uh, the person in the middle pulls, person behind them right through the chute. Mm -hmm. I've seen the video. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Poor planning. Wow. That's what that was. Wow. Actually, we use a base jump in one of Protect's ads. Uh, oh, nice. Of me, yeah. Oh, nice. I'm going to check that out. Yeah. Very, is it on the uh, Instagram? I believe it might be. Very cool. Very cool. I'm going to check everybody go check that out. Um, so first, you do your base, your, your mm-hmm. first building jump, and do you like it? Loved it. Loved it. Super cool. I mean, it's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a brand new team guy. I'm like... Nothing but piss and vinegar. Jumping off buildings. Jumping off buildings, deploying, going overseas. Like, I was loving life. Wow. All right, let's go. No way. And then uh, how often, or not how often, but um, from then, do you go to different buildings or different yeah. stuff and kind of find these antennas and all these other things? Yeah, and you start traveling. Um, you start going to Europe. You start going to other places in the U.S. And you really open up your radar to, oh, uh, everything, is, everything is a drop zone. Everything is an exit point. Uh uh, but there's places in Europe that you can go that are very well put together and mm-hmm. are almost feel like they're manufactured for base jumping. It's, really? It's really cool. Yeah. And when do you get into the wingsuit stuff? Um, about that time. Do you go to Europe first and base jump first before you go wingsuit? Over yeah, there? I did. And I had already started wingsuiting and I'd learned from guys that were sort of at the early stages of wingsuiting uh-huh. um, that had learned from the, the creators of those okay. very first wingsuits. Yeah. And so uh, it's a pretty cool, like, golden era type of time to learn how to wingsuit, like 2009, 10-ish. Jeez. Uh, 2010. And it's really cool. It's, it's as close as you can get to flying like a bird as a human. Do you jump out of a plane with one first? Oh, yeah. How many jumps did you have a plane before you jump off a cliff? Many hundreds. Hundreds uh, of the wingsuit I out had, of a plane? I had many, many hundreds of jumps, yeah. Out of, out of with a wingsuit on? Yeah. Because at this point, like, Today I have about sixty five hundred skydives and like eight hundred and fifty base jumps. Eight hundred and fifty base somewhere jumps. in there, man. And then uh, your first wingsuit off a cliff. Then where's that? Norway. Norway. Terrifying. Is that where Tom Cruise did the jump? I think he did. Uh, likely, yeah. I, think I need to look there. at it, but I think so. I think they went there. Um, so what's that like? Oh my god. Um, everything that you've done as a skydiver and a base jumper feels cumulatively unable to help you express how scared that you are and excited at the same time you're wearing something that's like a mattress right like zipped into this bag and you're about to push off into free air and free fall for two to six seconds before you can hear the wind whistling past you and before your wings really inflate to their full feeling so for two seconds or so, you're just like, and for a new jumper, you're going, oh God, like, is this going to be okay? Am I, is this going to work? Am I actually going to fly away? Because you're looking down at the ground that's coming up and the cliff below you and behind you. And until you start shifting away from it, and then the wingsuit's starting to fly. You're like, okay, oh, oh my God, okay, I can fly. I'm fly. I'm, I'm flying. And then it feels like you're in a fighter plane. Really? Oh, yeah. So you feel like you're flying. You don't feel like you're falling. Oh, you no, feel you like you're feel falling. like you're flying. Flying, flying. Man. And you're ripping going 110, 150 miles an hour forward. Wow. Oh, yeah. That is insane. What do you have to do before you pull? So do you have to, I mean, you're not. You have to flare. You have to, you have yeah. to cut speed. Yeah. Um, 
and relax. So okay. you're flying, you know where you're going, you're aimed at an area, like that's my landing area. I'm going to I'm gonna point at that, make sure I'm going kind of flat, dumb, and happy, going straight, push down with my wings and flare up. You're actually going to gain a little bit of altitude and slow your speed down. So you slow down and you pitch your pilot chute. Okay. Ride it out. Man. Yeah. And you're doing that at two to 500 feet. It's a thousand feet sometimes. Wow. Usually it's in the couple hundred feet range, like two to five hundred. Do you have reserves? No. No reserves. So base is a single parachute system. All bases. Mm-hmm. Man. So fun. That's wild. I don't encourage anybody to do it. And I'm being serious. It sounds like a bad idea. I've had many friends that have passed away doing it. Um, it's very, very dangerous. But as much as racing motorcycles, if you want to do it and you want to get into it, you're going to do it but I'm not going to sit here and encourage somebody to participate in an activity like that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. I was, you weren't talking me into it. I didn't think so. No, <laughs> I was worried about balls. Over there. I missed my window. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Austin might, but, uh, yeah, man, that is insane. Uh, and those videos you see of people that are like, are the inches from like cliffs that inches, they're, as they're moving this way? I have friends that have touched tree branches have on know, purpose. Are they trying to touch it when they go by? Not really, but they've touched them. Oh, so, there's zero inches from stuff. Yeah. Uh-huh. That sounds like a bad idea. That's how you die. Yeah. I mean, we're just, humans are basically sacks of jello. Yeah. We don't respond well to immediate deceleration. No. <laughs> Man. And so when do you, uh, you and Andy link up and start jumping off things? Yeah, that must have been 2014 or so. Okay. Um, I got to the jump team. And yeah, how did that work? So you're your SDV, you're doing your awesome stuff out there. You're jumping off things on your own, on your own time. So did you ever run into Tim IG? Uh, the name sounds familiar, but I can't put a face. He was face on to the it. jump team in the late nineties. Um, mm-hmm. and then ended up, he was an SDV guy. He was my SEA and I had had a package in to go over to the command. And I was like, man, I'm really young and I don't know. And like, man, if I'm hemming and hawing about this at all, cause I was like 24, uh-huh. 23, 24 when I put that package in. Um, I was like, I'll just, I'll pull it. Cause I don't want to like take a spot after I've been greenlit. And then that'll really piss those guys off. And that's like a, you know, once and done, if you screw that relationship up. So I just pulled it. I'm like, oh man, I'll just, I don't know. I'll go to trade at here. Like, I just wanted to mature, get okay. some other skills. And Tim pulled me aside and he's like, Hey, there's an, there's a spot at the jump team that I just saw yeah. on the roster. Well, you're bur- burnt out SDV or just like, no, I had done my five years and like, I would have been fine going to trade at. Um, which that would have been the next step as a trade ed or a, one of the training, you know, commands like buds or SQT or something. And, uh, Tim's like, well, how about you try it for the jump team? I'll put it in a word for you. I know the guy who runs the team, which is Jim Woods. Um, Jim was on the jump team and he runs the jump team. He has like 30, I don't know, 34,000 Scott abs now. 34,000. Like I'm taking a guess. So yep. please let me know that I'm wrong, Jim. And if it's more or less, um, ballpark. Yeah, he and I are buddies. Ballpark somewhere in there now. At the time, it must have been 30 or somewhere in there. But um, I went and tried out, got to the team, and then within a couple months of being at the team, Andy came in and had heard that there was a base jumper on the team, and Jim learned how to base jump in the 80s, so he knew I was a base jumper. Andy comes in, he goes, who's a base jumper in here? And I thought I was in trouble because I remembered him from second phase. I was like, oh, my God, this guy's got to be like a – captain now like i am so screwed why is he here like what did i do uh like he i got caught or something like somebody turned me in i don't know jim's like that guy and i'm sitting there like wow thanks nice thanks diamond me out there and uh, he's like oh cool and then he just wanted to talk about base jumping okay so was he already doing it he had i think he had just taken um miles's course very recently uh, which is a friend of both of ours and had been jumping some and wingsuiting. Okay. And he came in and augmented the jump team every once in a while. Huh. Um, so we started jumping together then. Okay. Yeah. Jeez. Man, that is crazy. So you're doing the jump team stuff, which yeah. is out of Brownfield. You guys go down there and train? Mm-hmm. Brownfield and Scott F. San Diego. So doing that. We were jumping a ton. What was your first uh, stadium jump like? God, I'm trying to remember which one it was. Or by that point, are you like, this it, is... It was wild. The, it was yeah. wild. Uh, it's it's an interesting experience. How jump. many times did you practice before you jumped into a game? A ton. Yeah. Uh, and like, we, we not practice in general, but practice at a stadium. Yeah. I, I, usually we do at least one or two practice jumps at each stadium. Okay. If we could. I've done very few blind. Um, 
I actually, I had to do one blind into the 49ers mm. um, because I did a, a jump that morning. Okay. And then drove up there. To San Francisco. To San Francisco. And that was the last year I was on the team. It was right at the, near the end of when I was on the team. So Jim was comfortable with me doing this. He's okay. Like, Here's the deal. I'll take a picture and I'll show you the video from our practice jump while we're on the plane. And then you can jump in. I'm like, sounds good. Cause I would jump the flag. So I was gonna be last. I was gonna be able to see everybody land. There was like all these reasons behind why it was going to be okay. And, um, that was, that was wild. Cause one side of that stadium, isn't it like water in the bay on one side? Um, I think that's candlestick. I, oh, think, that's candlestick. I think that's, okay. yeah, I think that's the giants. Oh, cause they moved. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they were moved South somewhere. Like it's not really in San Francisco. It's not anymore. really. It's like, yeah, o- yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Oakland. Okay. I don't know. It's yeah. no, it's or, like or, uh, Palo Alto. Palo Alto. Yeah. 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 Uh, which I've jumped man. into Stanford too. Oh, very cool. Man, what uh, jumping that flag? What's that like? It's how do you train for it? What's your first fl- jump? You start the flag with a little flag. Like? Oh, start, start with a hundred square footer, and then okay. a two hundred, then a five hundred, then an eight hundred, then a thousand. No kidding. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's really special to jump yeah. that flag. Yeah. Um, often you're opening up stadiums for the game or whatever's mm-hmm. going on, uh, concerts, races, the X Games. Everybody's watching you. Mm. And you cannot screw up. No. You got to put that thing right where you're supposed to put it, right on time. Wow. And there's often, um, you can hear when they're singing the anthem. Oh. From, As you're coming in. Yeah. Wow. And you're trying to time it pretty much in there. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Oh, where, do you, where do you drop? Like, where do you, how do you, you jump out? Mm-hmm. And it's then, on a bag in the okay. front of you. And then when you're at a, a specific altitude, uh, a couple thousand feet. Uh-huh. Three, four thousand, four thousand feet ish, somewhere in there. Um, it depended on the size of the flag and what size the stadium was. And there's all these yeah. kind of factors that go into that. Then you deploy it, and so what you do is with the really big ones, you stick your hand underneath the bag, which is on your chest, just like a ruck would be, or on your waist, and you pull a yellow cable, like a cutaway cable, and you pan like totally, just push it out. Okay, let it, let it all come out. It's yeah. got like a thirty pound weight on the bottom of it. Yeah, I've seen that. These flags are huge. I mean, yeah, they're, enormous. They're sixty by thirty Maybe. feet. Yeah, they're enormous. Dude, that's incredible. Yeah. And how about the guys that that uh, when you jump out and you have the smoke? Where's that? So that's attached to your foot on a metal, like an aluminum bracket. Okay, because uh, they're warm. Yeah, how's that? <laughs> what is that like? It's really warm. Yeah, yeah. I've burnt so many pairs of jump pants. Okay. Yeah. How do you? Uh, what ignites those? You reach down and pop a pin. It's a pin. It's a smoke grenade. It's a, it's one of our like actual. Oh, it's an actual. It's just a grenade. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I thought so it was like, like something special, yep. like for jumping. We would use, so <laughs> civilian jumpers use civilian like smokes. Okay. So they we, have like, we were just using military smoke grenades. Oh, wow. Cause they work great. Okay. They're super thick. Nice. The smoke is smoke. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's cool. It's super cool. Dang. What's up, everyone? This is Jeremy from Ironclad. We are so excited for the new SIG Studios film featuring Kevin Holland. One man, one path, many missions. It's available now exclusively on SIG's YouTube channel, but if you haven't seen it yet, check out this preview here. Had a lot of good memories right here. We really did. They thought it was an army, and it was 60 of us. He goes, you got a huge hole in your back. And I'm like, well, put something in it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I got out because we weren't at war. We're at war. I'm going back. That is wild. What else, other than stadiums, what else is, uh, do you jump into with uh, Leapfrog? Did you ever jump into the like, Army-Navy game? Mm-hmm. Um, I did the Army Navy game. Let's see, we did football games, baseball games, uh, F one race. We jumped into the UDT Museum down in Fort Pierce. We did a ton of air shows. Yeah, yeah. With the often with the Golden Knights yeah. for, the, for the air shows, right? And the Army Navy game. Man, yeah. And you just cr- just like stacking up jumps. You're Cran- just boom, yeah. Boom, I boom, mean, boom, I must have done three and a half thousand jumps in the years I was there. Wow. And on the weekends, or not? The weekends you're working a lot of the weekends we're working the weekends yeah yeah but we were fun jumping during the week if we weren't um jumping for work because i mean lord come on skydiving is so fun yeah yeah so we were just jumping so where are you finding time to jump off bridges and cliffs and that sort of thing at night <laughs> it's fantastic. or on vacation time yeah yeah Whew. wow amazing and then uh when do you figure out it's time to 
move on. Yeah, so that was 2016 or so. Um, and I had said, hey, I'm, I really want to put a package into Green Team, and that's where I want to go. And looking at the direction that the conflict was going, mm-hmm. watching the political spectrum, and it looked very much like uh, Clinton was going to get elected. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just was like, well, that's that's what's going to happen. She's the anointed one. And um, knowing what I had known through being in when she was there in office, right, as a, a cabinet member, I was like, I can't do this. This is not a thing I want to do. I, we had already gone into Syria, I think, at that point, right? I just didn't want to do it. You're good. That, like, you know that's what? sufficient. I had my I had my time. I'm nine years. It really looks like the conflict might be over here soon, like our part of the conflict. Uh-huh. And so I just called it. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to let my contract expire and be done. Wow. Um, and that's what I did. Amazing. Yeah, so I just pop smoke, let the EOAS come up, and I was done. And I'm, I'm happy I did that. Yeah. Looking back. That's right. My, the right yeah. move. Hey, when you know, you know. Well, and, you know? I, you know, and I know guys that are still in, and they all say the same thing, and they're like, yeah, you made a... At the time, we thought you screwed up, but two, three years later, they're, they're all basically saying the same song. Yeah. yeah. What was your plan? None. Uh, no. <laughs> Solid. So I, I had a plan to go teach and be a course director for a Air Force MFF course. Um, that fell through after I'd already got out. Like as a contractor for an Air Force course or working for a uh, private company? That, private company that was okay. going to run it. Um, they didn't get the contract. Mm. And they called me. They're like, hey, we're really sorry. We really thought we were getting this contract. And we don't have that position. If you want to move to South Carolina, you can come out there and kind of buy the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, absolutely not. I'm not moving to the East Coast. Yeah. Like, no. There was one reason for me to go to the East Coast ever. Yeah. And I had already chose not to do that thing. Right. Um, so not doing that, I kind of took a step back. Like, what am I going to do? Uh, I was doing some skydiving demonstrations. I was doing some tandems on the side. Um, and then I got a call from a friend of a friend to go do some security work. Uh, so I did some private security. I got to go to Beirut. That was oh, wow. kind of cool. Oh yeah. You told me about I spent, that. I spent weeks there. Yeah. yeah. I got to walk through like the green zone and like see the bullet wow. holes still in the buildings and Jeez. it was a cool place. Wow. Mm-hmm. And you're doing like executive protection type yeah, stuff. It was, it was executive protection stuff. And okay. then I worked with those guys for a while. And then right about then, um, I think it was, might've been that summer. I met Evan. Oh, uh, Andy and Dudley invited me to an archery event. Hey, I was at, at performance archery. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where we met? Yeah. Man. 17. Yeah. Right. At 17 or 18, was it 17, 18, I think. 17, 18, maybe. I think yeah. it was 18. Because I think the first book was out. That's why I'm thinking that. It's possible that it wasn't. I think, but I think the first book was just was out. 17. Time. Right around that time. Right Jocko that time. was there. Time. Jocko was there. Yeah. D- you, uh, you were there. Dudley, Dudley was there. Andy, Joe was there. Rogan. Um, it was all the Barclow. Heavy, Barclow. Uh, it was all the heavy hitters. Hey, it was good. It was a good time. It was a good party. Yeah. Um, yeah. We went and saw, we went saw, saw Joe's Rogan. show. Yeah. 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 That was cool. Yeah. Very cool. And uh, I think that was the first time Jocko shot a bow. Yeah. I think. Was it Bob Fromm's place? Yep. Yep. Bob, great. I bought my first bow from him. No, my first bow. My, my, I've had a bow since I was five. Mm-hmm. I've never been without a bow. Um, and after Bud's, my, my present to myself was a new bow. Oh. Uh, and yeah. a lot of changed over the, over the, but it's over there in the corner. I'll show it to you. Uh, looking at it now, it seems ancient. At the time, I was like, oh man, this is awesome. It, you could probably still kill something. It is. It. I'm sure you could. I want somebody to take a look at this <laughs> straight. I'm a little afraid to draw that thing. It's been sitting around for a little bit. Um, I mean, I feel the sentiment though. Like I bought, my watch when i showed up to sdv nice because i was like nice cool move. i made it right i did the thing i'm yeah. gonna get something for myself with yeah. a little bit of the bonus money did you get it in hawaii i did nice yeah i did like a used um rolex oh really what year shop. is it 2001 uh, mm-hmm. i think mine is 81 i wanted the small one uh, like, it's so it's like a i think it's I got a sea dweller i think it's the next dial size up yeah. or case design uh, from yours okay um, but I told the guy like that I would actually be using it. Yeah. Like for real, for real. And he's like, ah, well you probably shouldn't get like a true vintage, like mm. 80s vintage watch, like with the, um, acrylic. Mm. Yeah. Right. He's like, you'll, you'll bang it up. You, it's going to need more servicing. Yeah. This will look almost exactly the same. Uh, uh-huh. um, so I've worn that on every deployment, nice. almost every skydive base jump. It's kind of gone all over the world. That's awesome. When did you switch out the bracelet? Um, almost immediately. Oh really? What'd you put di- on first? I was diving with it. Yeah. I cloth right away. Like okay. A NATO. 
Okay. Yeah. Did I you ever? I still the, have all my paperwork and everything. And yeah, I, yeah. Kept all I, the receipts. I, I use the links for like dress events, like a wedding. Oh, you something. put it back on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Just back and forth. Because I got one from uh, a, a, a gift recently, very special gift. Um, somebody gave me one from 19, like early 90s. Yeah. Let's say 91. Mm -hmm. um, so I can put it, look at mine from 81 and uh, they look pretty much the same seed dwellers, but the, um, the loom is totally different. Oh yeah. So, so the loom is what stands out as being, as being different, but, uh, but they still look pretty much the same and I can tell cause mine has scratches and mm -hmm. stuff on it. But, uh, uh, and this one was really scratched up. Um, but, uh, I wanted to be able to, I wanted to, I needed to get it working again. So I did, I did that and they get, they let me keep, cause you know, when you send it into Rolex, oh, yeah. they don't, you can't, you can't ask them to say, Hey, this scratch is special. I want to keep the crystal negative ghost rider. Yeah. It's like, if you're getting the full cleanup, mm -hmm. it's, it's full. coming back. It's coming back. Cause it has the Rolex new. name on it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, very cool. I did manage to get, get the crystal also. Yeah. Yeah. So that was very nice. But, uh, but anyway, so, but I have that separate. So now watch awesome, but I want to be able to tell the difference. So I got one of the Everest bands, the rubber bands oh, yeah. where you still use the Rolex clasp and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And I went to the website. I did the video. It says, count your, count your links yeah. on your, you know, for your wrist size. You did it right. And did, yeah, I can't, I don't know how I messed this up. Cause I did it exactly right. Counted the links. Cause I have the one that I wear that yeah. has the, the bracelet. And so I counted, okay, this many on this side, I think it was like four and five or something like that. Um, and so then you click the box for that. They sent it, and then you have to find someone that's going to put this on for you if you don't know how to do it yourself. You probably do. Or have the um, tools. Yeah, yeah, which I do have now, but I didn't then. So I sent it to somebody who would do it because they, like Rolex jewelers, they don't want to, they won't put non Rolex stuff on a lot of times. I know. Uh, so I did get it to somebody who did it, and it came back. I'm like, awesome. And it's way too big. Ah. I'm like, son of, I did exactly what it said on the Everest band website. Time to change so it. now I'm like, ah, just, I gotta write a book. I, I gotta, it's gonna but like, get another know, year until I figure this out again. I know what you mean about like the scratches and mm -hmm. nicks. Like, yeah, see that. Nice, bro. like that has like, oh, it's, beautiful. it's got a, it's got a scratch or like a big nick on the side of the Sapphire face around like the four or five o'clock. Yeah. Mark. The, the upper like 12 o'clock on the bezel is cracked. That's, and then it's got, good, it's though. got some bumps and scratches on it, but you I, I it. love it's it. Tool watch. You yeah. used it. Nice. Yeah. Looks great on the black band too. Oh yeah. With the black and on black, the no date. Yeah. That looks really good. That I is think, solid. I think so. That is solid. Man, that thing. Yeah. And what you're you said back. 2001. So 2001. now, it, so now it's vintage. It's now, now yeah. it's vintage vintage and it's been worn a lot. That's sick. Yeah. Looks great, man. Yeah. Oh man. That's so cool. Yeah. I have one. So I have a, uh, Cause in the book I have, and I wanted to do some research and figure out if you could have gotten a seed dweller back in Saigon in 68. And so I'm writing the first, Can the you? first book and I just didn't know who to reach out to. You know, I didn't know I'm not on social yet, you know, whatever. I don't know. I'm like the only Rolex person that I know, you know, yeah. and I don't, uh, so I'm like, ah, oh, geez, like, where do I find the history of this sort of thing? And where can I trust it? So I just went with Submariner cause I know you could get the GMT and yeah. a Submariner and they've been in, making uh, the subs in Saigon for forever in uh in 68 so that's what i gave james reese's dad yeah. to that character and that's what i wove into the to the story but even when i put that in there i was like okay i'm gonna find somebody that i that really trust that i can go and talk to and find out if you could get a sea dweller and i'll switch it out yeah. and then everything everything was just got so busy and crazy i never found that that person uh now i have multiple people that i could reach out to to now to to ask about it but back then i i didn't so it remained a, a submariner but point being i also found in 1968 um Submariner. Oh, they're so cool. Uh, that's coming. So. They're gorgeous. Yeah. And like, I really wanted it as an ode to those exactly. first frogmen. Exactly. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to wear this damn thing. Yeah. And I wore it all the time. And that's I still, awesome. I mean, I still like it's, I didn't wear it just cause I'm like, I'm coming here to hang out. I should have thrown mine on today. Dang I, wear it. It. I wear it all the time. Nice. I love it. People are like, do you really wear it? I'm like, I wear it everywhere. Yeah. Like, guiding. I don't jumping. I don't care. That's awesome. Yeah. For one of the, the, OICs, when I first got to team five, he was prior enlisted and, um, uh, I'll just use his, yeah, Jeff, uh, his first name. And, uh, and he had a Rolex that was on mm -hmm. an aftermarket band. It was the first time I'd ever seen that because yeah. there's no, you know, I guess maybe there's websites somewhere maybe, but yeah. there's, they're not showing that stuff on the official Rolex website. No. If I ever even looked and at it. And they don't it like people with. doing that. And actually, you know what? I don't even think I've ever, no, there weren't websites back then. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it was uh, 97. 
Um, so I'm sure there were, but I wasn't looking at them. You know, I didn't have an email or anything like that at yeah. the time. And uh, so that's the first time I saw one uh, on a band. And then some of the old, like the divers and some of the older guys had like the Vietnam straps with like their uh, dive, like, you know, yep. bubble stuff on there. Yeah. So they, they had a couple like their the compass and their other shit. on. Well, there. not even the compass they had on the, they had a special bracelet that was oh, yeah. like handmade, like maybe in Vietnam or something. I don't even know, but would have like their, uh, dive, like a master diver oh, thing. Yeah. The, like, a, like their dive bubble. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I've yeah. Seen those. That's very cool. Um, so yeah, a lot of history with the, with the watches and the teams and then, yeah. man, a couple guys got the tutors before they destroyed them. Oh, right man. before. Those yeah. Are, that's a special thing. Yeah. Really special. Because for people that don't know, the SEAL teams didn't get issued Rolexes. They got issued Tudor watches because they had a sweeping second hand, and that's what they used for... A lot of guys bought Rolexes. Yeah, um, a lot of guys bought Rolexes. A lot of, a lot of Army SF guys bought Rolexes. Uh, I so, love when they bought them in Vietnam and Saigon, which is why yeah. I put it in the book. But yeah, the Tudor. So now I'm looking for a Tudor that could have been worn by somebody in that time frame. So I'm looking for one of those uh, yeah. as well. So 60s, you know, like mid 60s, early 70s, like somewhere yeah. somewhere in there. Somewhere in the range. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, there's a whole subculture of, of oh, watch people out there that, uh, uh, you know, know what they're know what they're doing. And now I have some trusted agents that I can ask questions and Perfect. and uh started collecting some seikos too from vietnam oh yeah those yeah, are cool so i got a couple a couple of those from vietnam i know what you're well, talking about so, yeah they're rad yeah very cool um man that's awesome watch tangent but everest i need to figure out how to get that uh that band uh i guess i gotta get a new one i gotta because i gotta order one that's smaller even though i did exactly what it said just go to the that. rolex dealership make them do it they, well no they don't do it they won't, they won't do the uh but now roll it because of the the popularity of people yeah. putting oh, rubber bands on. Now you can actually buy some Rolexes with Rolex rubber bands on there. Yeah. Um, so, um, or bracelets, I should say. Uh, so, so very cool. Very cool, man. That's an awesome watch. Yeah. Freaking. It's never, never going away. Yeah. The guy at the watch shop was like, I'll buy it from you. I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> Too cool. What was I going to ask you before we started going on, on watches? Oh, I don't know. I did. We were talking, I did executive protection. Then, uh, let's see, met Evan. Met Andy him. at the bow shop. Okay, we're on bow shop. I don't yeah. know how we got to watch this from bow shop, but uh, yeah, that was awesome. That was a great, great time out there. And we were actually Dudley was just here a couple of days ago, and I saw that. we were looking at that photo yeah. of us in front of like the limo before we went and saw Joe's oh, show, yeah. <laughs> and I uh, were like just thinking about how much has uh, has happened a since lot then has transpired. to everybody in that picture. Yeah, which is kind of kind of cool. Um, yeah, so we did that, and then uh, gosh, it was was it just a couple months later that we met up down in Moab. And you were jumping, mm -hmm. and I was down there with uh, with our youngest one. That's right. And uh, he was sounds right. Man, he just rock climbing and rappelling through this big like they have this big arch mm -hmm. and rappelling off the side of this arch down there. I was the Corona. Arch. I was so nervous watching him do it. It it's was so I was cool. nervous going out there because I'm like yeah. the kids are there. I'm the first one to go, and then uh, and then I'm at the bottom, and it's up there. You're like be strong. Yeah. And he no problem. He went right off. I'm like oh. Of course he did. <laughs> like, jeez. Uh, so that was really cool. That was a cool trip. And it was cool. great to see you down there in Moab. And you'd been jumping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I'd been there a couple of weeks or something. Yeah. It's a popular spot uh, for jumping. Yeah. Man. yeah. I've been going there a lot. For and we years. got to check out the uh, Tacoma. Oh, yeah. That was the early days of the Tacoma. Still, was it early days? Nice. Early -ish. Maybe two years old or something that I'd had it. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And uh, yeah, so that was awesome down there. And then, yeah, then we just kept uh, kept linking up. Mm hmm. Uh, and after that, but can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I don't want to. And now, now I'm gonna have to have you build me a bow. I want to be one of your first customers now gonna that you're gonna make some you can have some of these bows. Now. I want. That's what I want. Um, production, man, production model. Numero let's do it. One. Yeah, yeah. I want to go shoot these things here in a few minutes. But oh, yeah. um, man, it happened so. So you're out and then you start, you, you bounce around to a few different kind of freelance and you're taking pictures. You're an amazing photographer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're still an artist. If people go to your, yeah. your Instagram, you can see how you have that set up. Beautiful photos. Um, you go on Rogan and you guys talk about the photos and, and your background and, and all that yeah. stuff. And yeah, and then you've been jumping into the hunting side of things for a while. And yeah. a, are you an official guide now in Alaska? I'm, yeah, I'm a licensed assistant guide nice. in the state of Alaska for big game hunting. Um, and I guide with and for Cole Kramer and uh, Paul Shervenick up there. Nice. It's really cool. Actually, I'm going tomorrow. What? On a blacktail hunt. Yeah, I'm oh. going up there. To oh, guide. Cole texted me about that. <laughs> <laughs> I got a book to write. Yeah, so. I'm, uh, I'm going to be up there next Man, week. That is awesome. I got to get, I love Kodiak. Guiding clients. It is so beautiful up there. Did you go up there and do anything with SDV? Um, no, but you did at SQT. SQT. Yeah, yeah. I was up there in February. So it was oh, uh, nice. Getting some cold. Yep. Yeah. I've been up there in January. 
February, summer. I've been there a few times, but I love it. It's just so beautiful right. up there. And I love that terrain. Like I, I love, love that, that, I mean, it's a harsh environment going from the ocean and onto the, onto the rocks up in, uh, and then up and in, up into the snow and peaks and drop there's, back there's down. Glaciers. Like, it's beautiful. It's yeah. primordial. Like it, there's tundra out there and caribou, big, massive bears and yeah. deer. Like it looks very similar to what humans would have seen walking around there. Uh huh. 10, 12, 15, 18,000 years ago. Yeah, I love it. There's like not that much has changed. Yeah. The bears are a little bit smaller, but they're mm-hmm. still huge. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't look small. <laughs> they're like charging. No, um, they, no, they don't. I mean, you, you've been close to brown bears. You know. Yeah, they're they're not, uh, I've been fairly close. They're, yeah. they're big animals. That wall right there. Yeah, yeah it's a big animal. And yeah. he just pointed at a wall about five yards away. It's, it was pretty close. Big bear. It was a little, little closer than maybe than is ideal. When you can smell them. Yeah. And hear their breathing. Oh, I can hear that. It's a bit much. Yeah, it's so <laughs> it's, it's you definitely feel um, you, know, you have that something inside you, just like this little spark that takes you back to this ain't right your earliest. Well, to your earliest you know days of humanity. Essentially, oh, yeah. it's just so primal. It's amazing. But uh, when when was your first hunt then? Oh, let me think about this. So the first hunt I ever did, um, Andy gave me a call and he said, "Hey." You've been pestering me about learning how to shoot a bow. And we just had a guy drop out of a hunt. Do you want to come on a bear hunt with me and Dudley and a couple friends of John's? And I said, absolutely. He said, okay, well, it's predicated on you coming in two weeks to Kansas to learn how to shoot a bow. Because mm. John's there for like a wild turkey event or something. I can't remember what it was. Um, but in Kansas, uh-huh. they were doing a turkey hunt. Uh, Chad Mendez was out there. Yes. And so John taught me how to shoot, brought a bow. And then I just practiced for a month and went on a bear hunt in Canada. Nice. So the first, the first animal I took with a bow was a bear. Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's not the one across the lake, right? That's a different hunt. Um, no, same. That's the same one. Same area. Same area. Yeah. So first, and you're loving it. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah. I loved it. You so, Do you have a Hoyt on that one? I did. Yeah. yeah I think I had a carbon defiant. Nice. Mm-hmm. So bear, you're in, and then... uh, And it was like full steam ahead. Yeah. I was ready. I was immediately on board with hunting shit. Yeah. Uh, And then about a year later, I met Cole at Barclow's 50th birthday. Oh, nice. And Barclow was like, (coughs) you two are going to get along. I need to introduce you guys. And so Cole and I talked. We hung out at John's house, and that's how I got started guiding, because he just invited me. He's like, hey, you want to come be a packer? Yeah. It's terrible work. We won't pay you very much, and it'll suck. I'm in. I was at STVs. Nice. Okay. Yeah. I was at STVs, yeah. buddy. Well, John was a diver. So. Yes, he was. <coughs> oh, man. Sorry about the coughing. We got that remodel going inside, and there's that, all that stuff in the air, that nastiness. It's going to look good. Uh, I'm going to get that HEPA filter. Yep. Yeah. It's crazy. It's messing with my, messing with the lungs. Ugh. Um, man. So when do, you, when do you decide that you're going to, you want to be a guide? A couple of years of packing, I I really just loved it. Um, I I loved a, a culture that I had not been introduced to as a kid, an activity that I I realized that learning from Cole and the guys that guide with him and yeah. for him and around him that he had learned from, that I could become a very good competent mm-hmm. hunter. Transfer that into guiding, and my own hunting very quickly. So yeah. I went from basically zero to you know, 60 miles an hour with the bow Mm -hmm. and with how to hunt, how to stalk animals, how to plan hunts, how to pack for hunts. Mm -hmm. It was an education. Yeah. Um, It was like going to school. It was like being a new guy at a team. Yeah. And when I realized that I liked it, I told Cole, I'm like, okay, what's the process for me to be an assistant guide? Mm -hmm. Because I want to do it. He goes, okay, well, here's the deal. You have to get signed off by me and Paul and get these letters of recommendation get these notarized things and do all these, like take a test and, you have to spend this much time in the field and this much time in Alaska and it has to happen over this much time and then you apply and pay for it. And if you pass and the application goes through and all the letters and everything are, you know, ducks in a row, mm-hmm. state of Alaska will issue you the license. Nice. Yeah. So it's a process and I appreciate that they do that process. Like yeah. That. Um, <coughs> and man, like the next step for me is being a registered guide mm-hmm. and I'll be doing that. And then it's master guide. Is that the next one? Are there three or how many levels are there? Guide, master, I think, yeah. And then the next one's like outfitter. Okay. So that's the next step. And I'm definitely going to take it. Nice. It's, it's a very cool thing to be able to help 
yeah. people that are good hunters already uh-huh. get that animal of a lifetime for them. Yeah. And I'm learning so much. I mean, I've, I've had my hands in, in the processing of so many animals now that I'm exceptionally comfortable. I mean, last year I felt totally comfortable to the point where I was able to take a cow elk with a longbow alone. Wow. Did all the processing and I don't, I couldn't have done that without getting introduced to archery from, yeah. from Dudley, getting invited to go on the hunt by Andy mm-hmm. and then learning all this information from everybody around me and Cole specifically. Cole I had his shirt on the other day, uh, doing the podcast, yeah. uh, Cole Kramer. Yep. Out of Alaska. Everybody going up to Kodiak. Look Cole up. Great guy. Yeah. He's going to so. come down at, at some point. Awesome and, guy. Uh, we'll have him in here at some point for sure. But such a good, such a good dude. I'll well, maybe have you up on a hunt at some point. I know. We've been every year. I, know. I get at the, I get the invite every year. And uh, a lot of times it's when people drop out also. Um, the short and list. And uh, yeah, and it just hasn't, I mean, right it around at that time, I'm like doing editing fast and furious, finishing up the book and, and all that. So it hasn't worked out yet, but it, it will at some point because I want to get back to I really want to get back to Kodiak. I love it oh, up there, and so I need to cool. go on a hunt with Cole up there for sure. Yeah, man, I would. I'd encourage you to. Amazing. Uh, what's uh? So I'll work during this time, other than than guiding your black rifle, doing that. I went on a base jumping trip, um, filmed some pretty junky comp, you know, content for them. Uh, very uh, low grade stuff that I didn't know what I was doing, but I think they could see a potential. Okay. And Evan, at the time, I was very early in black rifle. Yeah. He said, hey, how about you just come work for us? You know, do you have a job right now? I said, well, no, I don't have a job, basically. I was just moonlighting, doing security yeah. stuff and all this other. You're still in San Diego? It together, Yeah, in San Diego. And um, he just asked me to come on board. Went and talked to HR, and there it was. I was a photographer yeah. for Black Rifle. And um, tried to perfect the craft as best as I could and just volunteer for everything I could do. Worked my ass off. And moved out here. And then I moved out here. Yeah. Yeah. Because I wanted to get away from kind of the revolving door of the possibility of um, going out every night and, mm. and that sort of mindset. Um, yeah. So I'm going to start a new chapter. Yeah. Just kind of change. It's good to make a, when you make a psychological break with something, I believe that it is also beneficial to make a physical break with that location as yeah, well. Absolutely. Yeah. I just think it kind of goes hand in hand. And it's been great. Like, like uh, this last season, I was able to ski, you know, 80, almost 85 days. I know you did. I, I kept looking at you. The greatest winter in Utah history. I skied like three days. It's okay, man. <laughs> there was only 904 inches. Oh, at that time. It's not a big deal. I had to uh, write a book. I yeah. know. That's how it goes. The only time it's quiet around here is when everyone else is on the mountain. It's okay. I was skiing for you. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's, yeah, uh, I'm glad insane. everybody got to, got to enjoy a great winter out here. Mm-hmm. Um, just, uh, yeah, amazing. We had some quite a bit of snow. Just <laughs> up at this elevation. Awesome. Oh man. And so you move out here and you're doing all the awesome stuff that you do. Yep. And, uh, and then when did you learn to take pictures and video, uh, while in free fall? Like, did you do any of that on the jump team? Like, yeah. do you have a helmet that has a I did camera? A, I did a little bit of it when I was in Hawaii, okay. um, at a really poor level. I thought I was great. Mm. And then at the jump team, Jim, who's done some Hollywood videography and, okay. and filming, um, really taught me how to be yeah. a skydiving videographer, which I'm still in comparison to the people that work at drop zones. Mm. They're experts. You know, I used to be good. I'm well out of practice now, Okay, but man, it, it's a, it's a really cool craft to be able yeah. to frame a person up and then you're self-directing what you're filming and you really only have the one take. Yeah. And you, did you do that? Uh, so you do that in uh base jumping also? You can, it's a little bit different, but yeah. Cause like, I've seen, I've seen videos and they're like, okay, we go, yeah. go. Yeah. And the guy, mm-hmm. that's friggin' crazy. That's fun too. Jeez. Uh, can a drone, I mean, yes. can you only get the first part in a base no. jump? Not in a wingsuit. The race, no, the race drones can follow a wingsuit. Really? Yeah, I'll, a I'll race sh- drone? Yeah, I'll show you some of these videos. No way. They do some wild stuff. I mean, flying around people in front of, behind. It's, oh man. It doesn't look real. Wow. Yeah. That is crazy. Cause I figured that would, they, most drones would get left. In the Precise, dust. And I, they used to be up until a couple of years ago. Wow. Now those things are as fast as helicopters. Dude, incredible. And then uh, when did you start? Uh, so Protect, that's yeah. now. And uh, you were familiar with them before, though? I have been using their products for almost the whole time they've been around. Nice. Um, sometime during COVID. So maybe they were a year old. Yeah. Three and a half years old now. 
So about their first year of production, uh-huh. I started testing their products. Uh, nice. Thank Mark Carter for that, maybe. Okay. Or Mark Healy, one of the two of them. Yeah. Had a package sent out, a care package. Like, yeah, you're going to like this stuff. I'm like, yeah, sure. Okay, fine. Received it. I'm like, I do like this stuff. Yeah. Um, got to be friends with both of them really well. And I got to be friends with Tim, uh, who's the, one of the co-founders over yeah. there. And I just kept using the product, kept using the product. I love those guys. I yeah. love taking trips with them. I love the product. There, you go. Um, there it is. There's yeah. my energy right there. I'm yeah. like, they do everything you need in the day and you can use one or all of them. Like it's like yeah. energy, it's hydration, it's rest, it's immunity. They do amino acids. It's like this whole list of things. There's right? Mark right there yeah. on, the, on the bag. Healy. Right there. Yep. Yeah, this is all. This is amazing. I think I might have got my first box about the same time then. Probably, because so, I remember what house we were in. So it was. Uh, I think there was a 20, few of us that got them. One maybe that first, just like cart, like yeah. just a cardboard box full of stuff. Yeah. Like okay, what is this? And it was all those, like those bags. Yeah. Yep. Is, it, is, is this an original bag? Do they not come like this anymore? No, they don't. We're, oh, they don't. We're putting them in boxes now. Okay. Like um, this box, or is this an old one too? No, that's that's new. That's it. Okay. Um, it sits better on shelves and like the. It's easier for um, brick and mortar places to sell it, okay, and stock it. Yeah, uh, but the number poor energize. Yeah. You ever take the energy without the water and just just pound it? I've done it, Cole, and I've done it. It's yeah. not too bad. It's not recommended. Yeah, it's just, you want you want to mix it. Taste. Yeah, you want to mix it. And strong, I mean, like it's meant to be mixed in yeah, yeah. twelve to sixteen ounces of water. Okay, um, but everything's awesome. I, I love yeah. the products. It's you know sugar free. We use stevia to uh, sweeten it. That's another natural ingredient, mm. but Great company, great guys. I loved all their stuff. We'd become very good friends. Uh, Black Rifle had grown a ton. And I was already planning on making an exit. And then perfect timing. It sort of happened for me. Um, They restructured. And I told Tim, I'm like, let's do this. Nice. I want to work for you guys full time. I believe in your product. I believe in your team. I like your mission. Let's rock and roll. Nice. And so since February, I've just been hammering with them. Awesome. What are you doing for them? Um, so I'm in like a mixture of a marketing and kind of talking head role. Okay. So I do a lot of appearances. I do like I was at all the tax, um, podcast writing, helped film some commercials for them, help with some of their marketing direction. Uh, right now there's only like 13 in place. So yeah. everybody's got their hands on everything. Okay. Except finance. Don't trust the knuckle dragon frog man in finance. No. You want to stay out of trouble with the IRS. Charge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Leave that to Andrew. Yeah, that's that Andrew's job. Professionals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Man. So yeah, veteran owned. Yep. Zero unnat- unnatural ingredients. Zero crash sugars and artificial sweeteners. Bingo. Awesome. Man. Um, yeah. Love Nerd. this stuff. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So that yeah, the hydration, like I said, the hydration for me um, and the energy for me are the ones that are yeah. my go-tos. Um, and uh, for I'm gonna, me, I'm gonna try the rest again. For me, it's the rest and the hydration because yeah. I mean, I'm I'm constantly training. Like I yeah. train every day, whether it's some sort of workout or me, you know, building bows or I'm, I'm doing something physical every day. Yeah. So, and then also being a guide, like I really have to be on top of my shit, yeah. uh, mental capacity and physical. So this kind of product lineup helps me maintain it without having like any weird gut issues or any dependence on things. Mm. This is it. These all I feel like are added benefits yeah. to living in the now. Yeah. It's not a thing I have to have. Right. So you really do get to supplement your diet with these. Okay. In a great way and give yourself an advantage. Man. Awesome. What uh, what workouts are you doing these days? What should I be doing? Oh man, um, you're like just something. Yeah. No, uh, I do a ton of biking, indoor biking, uh, a lot of assault biking. I have a full set of kettlebells. I use a lot of kettlebell work and do versa climbing. Most of my workouts are versa climbers. Legit. Mm-hmm. I have one in the garage. Nice. I'm gonna get one when we maybe turn this into the the gym. I'm not sure, but yeah. uh, in rehab after I had some. Uh, surgery in the teams i went to the uh, rehab yep. and um man that those workouts were the workouts that i then used after rehab when i didn't oh, yeah. need to do 
rehab anymore. I use those workouts. They were incredible. And the Versa Climber was a part of that. You know, I'd seen it. I'd seen it in movies. I'd seen it in gyms. Uh, I'd used it a couple of times, but you don't know how to really use it effectively until you do do the deep dive on the Versa Climber. You need somebody to tell you what's going on. Yeah. Otherwise, you just sort of do this. And I kind of, why is this so hard? But once you use that and understand how to use it and have some go-tos that are different uh, workouts with that thing, awesome. And you channel your inner Drago. You do. Yeah. Totally. You can think about it. Yeah. <laughs> the mu- music will play in your head. You can't stop it. Um, up and down the river was one. Throwing the rate, weight vest on. And uh, I have still have them all written down. In a, and I, I got there. introduced to the Versa Climber at STV because okay. they had one. Um, they have two of them on the boomers, mm. on the submarines. Okay. So we would do like, oh, climb Everest or max in an hour or, you know, max uh-huh. an hour and a half or whatever it was. Oh, there's so, some good ones. Oh, yeah. There's some real ass kickers. Uh-huh. Yeah. I yeah. love that thing. But I tend to do... <coughs> An hour and a half ish of um, zone two type cardiovascular work, mm. like five to six days a week, and then do kettlebell work on top of it, and yeah. a little bit of barbell stuff, and um, and I go down to the nonprofit gym space, yeah, um, which is run by Mark Twight, yeah, uh, Michael awesome. Blevins and Aaron Blevins, and their stuff is legit. If you if if you want a one stop shop for hey. I need a place to understand how to get my body in mm-hmm. order. That's a holistic approach to everything from mind, body, and flexibility. Mm-hmm. They're it. They just released an app. Take a look at it. It's freaking, oh, did they? It's freaking awesome. Like, I have zero vested interest. Like, yeah. No monetary anything. Yeah. These people are just amazing people. Nice. And I taken, did not know they had the app. They've taken decades to put this amount of knowledge together, yeah. and this thing is the product. Yeah. Yeah, it's rad. Uh, yeah, Mark Twain, I got to go on his podcast a couple of years ago and uh, oh, awesome yeah. guy. Of course, we have, you know, multiple touch points, multiple friends that are all, uh, you know, that we've, we've all known over the years and just hadn't linked up. But uh, what Great a cool dude. dude. Oh, my gosh. He was a hero of mine as a kid. Extreme as a, alpinism. As a climber. Um, yeah. I have some of his limited edition books here and trained the guys for 300 most famously, probably. Yes. That, yeah, most famously. He trained a bunch of the dudes from the command mm-hmm. uh, for years. And uh, that's how he met Barklow. And that's how he got they're all tied into that community. Yeah. That's how Andy met him yeah. climbing. Um, I love that guy. Yeah. And, uh, and then Michael and Aaron Blevins are, have been working with him since the 300 movies. Oh, wow. And training all the superheroes and yeah. that whole nine yards. And they've developed a system that is works. People there yeah, get, right. you know, little bumps and bruises, but they're fit. Yeah. They're happy. And they're moving forward. Like nice. growth is a big thing. Nice. What is it called now? So that is that place is called nonprofit. Nonprofit. Yeah. N O N dash profit, not profit. Yeah. Non profit. <laughs> like a profit. Yeah. Not monetary. Great people. And then they run something called the space program, which is their like workouty thing. Nice. Yep. Amazing. I got all right, I'm gonna check out the app. But uh man, all right, and then bows. Look at these things. Look at this. Dude. This oh yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing this up. This is awesome. So, so yeah, what maybe like a month ago I was yeah. like, man. I I thought about it for so long. Like this is another human skill that would be really cool to try and like feel my hand out and you know touch a piece of history. So I I just I literally just ordered a whole bunch of rocks. Okay. I'm like I'm gonna watch some videos and get a book and try and learn how to do some flint napping. Nice. So I got a ton of I got like 20 pounds of obsidian and like 20 pounds of flint sitting in my garage. Um, I've gone through about half the obsidian. And only have made four arrowheads from it. So yeah, that's beautiful. I have destroyed a whole bunch of obsidian. That's mahogany obsidian. Uh, wow. I believe it came from Oregon. And that. that's an arrowhead that I flint napped. Dude. How do you, so how do you, what tools are you using to do this? Uh, it's a mixture of copper headed hammers. Yeah. Like knock the big pieces off. Yeah. And then little tiny copper chippers. Yeah. That you can pressure flake with. Okay. Yeah. Which replace the um, antlers that people used to use. Man, I mean, I want to, it's so beautiful. I want to frame it, you know? It's amazing. I really appreciate this. I could also make an arrow and just haft it to it for you. That would be sick. Yeah. But hold on to it. Yeah. Yeah, I I figured like, hey, this would be something weird and unique that I could bring. Dude, it's kind of cool. I love it. It is really cool. And uh, man, and before we go shoot these bows, what, uh, What's, what, what's uh, the next five years look like? Are you, oh, uh, yeah. Well, I definitely want to get a master guide license. Yeah. Um, I want to participate in and help protect, grow, and show 
the industry that is out there for supplements, mm-hmm. why a liquid supplement that we have uh-huh. is so much better and different. Um, continue that mission with people that are freaking awesome human yeah. beings. Uh, I want to keep building bows and I, I just, I want to keep diving into what it means to be a human. Yeah. And for me, that's everything from that in your hand, which is about as far back as we can go. Mm-hmm. Humans have been chipping tools. I mean, they recently found um, a, a different human species, Denaletti, mm-hmm. that had a chipped stone tool. That's 230,000 years old, right? So humans have been doing that for a quarter million years. So I want to know what it's like to do that all the way to using like my 28 nozzlers in the truck, becoming hyper proficient at shooting a mile. Mm. Like I want the entire range of human the spectrum, the spectrum from today yeah. to yesterday. Man. That's Man. what the next five years looks like. That's awesome. So continue deep dive into those. Love it. Awesome, brother. Awesome. Well, thank you for making the trek up. It had been too long. That's ah, too and, long. Uh, it's an yeah, easy drive. I'm glad we have, uh, you know, that once again, the podcast for me is a, is an excuse to, to link up and, Absolutely. Uh, and hang out for a bit. And now let's, uh, let's go shoot these bows. Let's go shoot some bows. Awesome. Thanks brother. Absolutely. Thank you. I've been a fan of black rifle coffee company since their inception. I love when veterans leave the military and pursue their passion. In this case, coffee. The coffee is fantastic, and as an added benefit, the company is built on quality, patriotism, and giving back to the veteran and first responder communities. I've been a subscriber to the BRCC Coffee Club for years and love it. My favorite is Silencer Smooth. It gets delivered every single month. The Black Rifle Coffee Club. Being part of the club gives you the power to elevate your coffee experience to the next level. The Black Rifle Coffee Club puts you in the driver's seat. You pick the texture and the roast you want, the frequency you want it delivered, and the quantity. You get to completely personalize your club orders, ensuring that your favorite coffee is sent to your door exactly how you want it, when you want it. Right now, Black Rifle Coffee is offering an exclusive opportunity for new coffee club members. Join today and enjoy 30% off your first order when you use the discount code Danger close at checkout. That's right. 30% off just for being a part of our growing coffee community. Remember to use the discount code danger close at checkout. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the danger close podcast. All right. Got a few things today. PSE archery, Pete Shepley. Look at this. Thank you so much for this blade. That is just awesome. Really appreciate it. And thank you also Pete, legend in the archery industry, to showed up at my book signing in Arizona for Only the Dead. Looked down in the front row right there, and there was Pete. So uh, thank you so much, my friend. And actually, my one of my PSE bows is right here, um, right here. And John Dudley put this one together. This is the NTN 33 knock-on custom. And uh, so right there, PSE, awesome. Get back over here. And Pete, once again, thank you for the blade, and uh, thank you for all your support and for, for all you've done for archery and for bow hunters. Uh, poo, protect right here, um, P-R-O-T-E-K-T dot com. This is the energy right here. They have hydration, rest, and immunity, but uh, liquid formula, tear, pour, and energize. So the energy and the hydration are the ones that I've used the most over the last few years as I've been writing these novels. Awesome stuff, great crew. Uh, be sure and check them out, P-R-O-T-E, KT. All right. Uh, this bow right here. So this is from uh, Tracker Joe 8 on Instagram. So check him out right here. He made me this bow after reading Savage Sun. And this thing, look at that. Beautiful bow. And I finally shot it. Um, it was just, it's such a work of art that I didn't want to shoot it. But uh, today I did. And Shot these arrows right here. He made these arrows as well. Here's one of them. Once again, Tracker Joe 8 on Instagram. Look at that. So sent a few arrows down range with Trevor Thompson. And Trevor built a bow. If you listen to the podcast, you know that he is building bows now, making arrows. And I think he might start doing it semi-professionally. Is that the way to say it? If you just 
do it every now and again for people. But uh, by the time this podcast drops, be sure, sure and check out what he has going on. And Trevor.P.Thompson on Instagram will probably be the best way to find out about that. But the bows that he built, awesome. And I cannot wait to be customer number one. So very cool. Um, awesome. All right. Simple Strap. Go to Simple Strap on Instagram. And look at that right there. Very cool. And not sure which watch I'm going to put this on, but uh, this is from another Trevor and from Firefighter right there and loves to make watch straps. And this one is really nice. I love that green right there. If you can see that. Very cool. Once again, at Simple Strap on Instagram, check out what he has going on over there. And uh, Trevor, thank you so much for all you do as a, as a firefighter. Awesome. And let's see, before I get to the rifle, so this is called, so Killing the Shepherd, uh, Beyond the Film, and this is the film right here. Uh, I have not watched it yet. I need to watch it. Tom Opry right here, and be sure and check out this book. Uh, spent three years documenting the lives of a remote community in Zambia led by a woman chief who dared to break the bonds of poverty by waging a war on wildlife poaching. So right there, Killing the Shepherd. Looking forward to checking this out and finally watching the film. So check that out once again, Killing the Shepherd. And let's see if there's a website on here, uh, shepherdsofwildlife.org. So check that out. And I have not been to the website yet, but I'm going to check it out, and I'm guessing that's where you can get uh, the film and the book. Killing the Shepherd, once again, shepherdsofwildlife.org. And before I get to the rifle, here we go. Triple Ot Design. Uh, I've been wearing a bunch of stuff from Triple Ot Design for the past couple of years now. Love their stuff. And uh, look at that. They made me a little a special backpack right there. So they know I'm a backpack person, and I'm looking forward to putting this through the paces. And I can just tell how solid this thing is um, just by messing around with it. So very cool. TripleOtDesign.com. Check them out. And guys, thank you so much for this and for this special edition right here. Super cool. And Sig Sauer, look at this right here. Oh, the cross. So this right here, they have a bunch of different models now. This is one of the early ones right here. And this thing is awesome. Did the Sig Hunter games with one of these a couple years ago. Uh, stock folds right there, which is super convenient if you haven't ever had a rifle with a folding stock like that. And they just did an amazing job with this. So very cool rifle right there. Be sure and check them out. All the different models they have for the cross, sigsour.com. And I think that's it. Take care. See you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about what Trevor has going on, be sure to follow him on Instagram at trevor.p.thompson. Also, be sure and follow Protect, P-R-O-T-E-K-T, -E and check out their supplements at protect.com. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA, officialjackcar.com. That is the website. Click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there, stay safe, be strong, keep fighting.